call to order the meeting of the Brawley City Council and successor agency to Brawley Community Redevelopment Agency. This is our regular meeting agenda for October 19th, 2021 at 6 p.m. here in City Council Chambers. We'll have our roll call. Councilmember Wharton. Here. Councilmember Castro. Here. 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 Okay. This time I'd like to ask Detective Daniel Schleyer to come up and lead us in our invocation. You all stand. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we first of all thank you that we can gather. Lord, we ask you that um, you uh, guide our hearts and minds tonight to uh, make decisions, to uh, talk things, important things, Lord. Lord, uh, this is your community, Lord, and uh, we, uh, we pray that um, you take us by the hand, Lord. Lord, we are honoring you. We want to wanna glorify with, uh, you with our life, Lord. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Castro, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, sir. Ready? Begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, before the approval of the agenda, there are some changes to be made to that. I'll ask our city manager to go over those, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, on consent item 3C, that needs to be pulled. The uh, county sent some information to amend today, so uh, that'll be brought back to you at a later time. Under regular business, uh, item 7B, Discussion and potential action to adopt resolution number 2021 should be amended to read for the examination of sales use and transaction tax records. Uh, the current contract with HDL shall continue to exist and is not being amended. It's just the language in the uh, uh, resolution for some changes at the state level. Uh, item 7C, ABC license on the agenda. Uh, it says uh, applying for a type ABC type 20 in the staff report is correct. It's a staff, uh, I mean, a liquor license number 21 that they are applying for. On item 7E, discussion and potential action for deferral of impact fees. That is two projects, not three. The third project already has a, a unit on that, so there would not be any impact fees on that, but the staff, pro staff report is correct. Okay. okay. Looking for a motion to approve the agenda with those modifications. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay. The agenda is approved as modified. Item two, public appearances and comments. Not to exceed four minutes. This is the time for the public to address the council on any item not appearing on the agenda that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Is there anyone here? to give a public comment. Okay. Uh, we do have a uh, presentation from our Chief of Police, Jimmy Duran. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council, City Manager, and public. Well, today uh, it's, been a, it's been an awesome day because we had the opportunity to, to promote uh, two individuals within our agency. Uh, and this is going to be a nice add-on to our department. Uh, and today I wanted to recognize them, but unfortunately one of them couldn't make it, had some personal matters to attend to, and that's uh, now Sergeant uh, Ricardo Gutierrez. But I do want to talk about him uh, in a good way. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, Sergeant Gutierrez uh, has been with the department for 15 years, although he's not present here. Uh, I do want to recognize him publicly uh, of his efforts. I think he earned his stripes uh, by dedicating his uh, a professional life to this community for 14 years, and I think that's an accomplishment in itself, you know, given our today's police environment. And also, I want to talk about uh, Commander uh, Jonathan Blackstone, who's present here. I mean, this is a person that does not need introduction into our community because I think a lot of people know him. You know, he's been with the police department for almost 17 years, and I just wanted to recognize him publicly. So I, I want to say congratulations, uh, Commander Blackstone, uh, for a well a job well done. 
that was pretty much it. So I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware. And I know some of you attended this morning's uh, uh, ceremony, so I do appreciate your attendance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commander Blackstone, thanks for uh, stepping up and taking over that role. And we appreciate having you on the department. Thanks for mm -hmm. Uh, I see Captain William Perkins from uh, the NAF. Did you have a comment to make, sir? Uh, I think I'm very sure. I don't think I have too much of time. Um, Hello, Mayor, Hello, Council. Very nice to meet you all for the first time, many of you. Uh, now that COVID is allowing us to get out in town, I'm making my way around, and I intend to, to join each of the community councils about once a quarter uh, to ensure that you know your concerns are my concerns. Um, more than half my sailors live out in town somewhere in the, in the, in the valley, and 82% of my workforce that lives that works on the base is, is part of your, your community. So I want to make sure that you know that uh, what you're working on and what your struggles you have, uh, they're important to me as well, and any way we can do to, uh, to aid in those, uh, we're absolutely uh, all, all on board with that. Uh, and we are doing everything we can to get back to normal. Um, so I can tell you that I don't know what next year's festival flight's going to look like, but it's going to look as close to normal as we can get it to based on where we are with COVID, where we are with our vaccinations. And, uh, and I appreciate everyone's uh, support for that. And we're going to do the best we can to get back to the Valley every March like we have for mm -hmm. 75 years. So mm -hmm. that's all, right. all I had. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And I'll stick around if anybody wants to talk about anything offline. Commander, I have a question, Mr. Mayor, if I could. Are, are you going to still try to have the run, the 10K run? Um, that's up to the Blue Angels. That's not hosted by us. Okay. Um, okay. But I believe they're planning toward that, and okay. uh, it may look a little bit different. Uh, mm -hmm. But as soon as we have information about that, we'll make it available. I'm challenging some of my council members. <laughs> We're going to be there, uh -huh. so that'll uh -huh. be great. Thank you. <laughs> How many miles is that? It's ten, ten, uh, 10 k. Ten so. yeah. k. Six point two. Yes. Six point two. <laughs> yeah. Commander Blackstone. It traditionally, yeah. starts at the Sunbeam Lake and terminates right near the front gate. That's it. Yeah. It terminates uh, sooner for some. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will be honest. I cheated. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I've got that base memorized. I ran that over and over many times. Like, Lee before I right before I left back to the Marine Corps in the nineties. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? If not, item two D is a presentation on the Andy Dwell and Rancho Los Lagos projects by Tom Dubose. Do you mind? Not at all. Donnie, do you mind? You're the closest one to me here. Just being safe. There you go. <laughs> all heart, you know? So thank you, Honorable Mayor and uh, members of the council for the opportunity. For us to, uh, I think, really present some exciting things. And I know all of you are aware of some of these, but the general public is not. But we wanted to take an opportunity to share them, not just with you now, but with the public. Um, one of these is, is happening. And the other project we want to talk about is, you know, something that's already approved, but we want to now move that into the city of Brawley. And we hope that this message is positive in a number of ways, and we'll get into more of that a little bit later. But what we want to talk about first is the Indy Dwell project. This is a project that's being brought to the city of Brawley by the Benson family. Uh, they're the ones who've put this together, and I, I don't want to steal any more of Laura's thunder, but they're really uh, one of the ones that have brought this to us. And this is the opportunity. We've already been through the Planning Commission to create the parcel. We've already been through city staff to get the site plan approved. And so with that, I'm going to let Laura talk about Indy Dwell and then introduce the Rancho Los Lagos project. OK. Double vaxxed. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, council members, for your time and to the public for coming out. Um, my name is Laura Benson Vandaway, and I'm a Brawley native, proud Brawley native. And go ahead and, or actually, where's the button? Push to the right. Is that right? On this? Okay, there we go. Um, Indy Dwell Brawley. The Indy Dwell Brawley project is a project that came to me uh, because I am the chief innovation officer 
for a nonprofit affordable housing developer in Los Angeles known as Decro Corporation. That's a little DG on the corner up there. And Decro Corporation uh, builds, like I said, affordable housing and also other community development projects throughout Southern California and, and also in Florida. IndieDwell is a new project for Decro uh, because it's our first industrial building. We're very excited about that with a strong goal as a nonprofit to both support the affordable housing industry within where we work, but also economic development. So, so the, the real initiative here is for economic development. It is a new 100,000, just over 100,000 square foot industrial building build to suit for a tenant known as Indie Dwell. I'll talk a little bit more about them on the next slide. There will be uh, about 200 new living wage jobs created at this factory and something I'm especially excited about, they also are offering employee ownership opportunities for those new employees, which, you know, that's very progressive. Mm -hmm. Overall, the investment will be north of $10 million into Brawley. Obviously, that'll be a good boost, not just to the local economy, um, property tax base, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we like how we build buildings and they increase your property tax base. But also, we hope there'll be some sales tax revenue generated from that new building as well. And um, we're, it is in an opportunity zone, which is very exciting. I, this might be the first opportunity zone project in you know, attracting ozone, as it's known, investors from outside. It's in the north end of Brawley, um, as you can see on the, on the little map, heading, heading out toward the bypass. And you know, it's, it's, it's an industrial building. Um, the, Development partners on this development team, in addition to Decor Corporation, AC Martin is the architect of record. They are a very well-regarded industrial, well, they have, they have a full pr uh, practice across all industries, but this is um, quite a small project for them on, uh, out of their industrial practice, and they brought a lot of great uh, insight. DeBose Design Group is providing landscape civil engineering services as well as the development support. And KPRS is our general contractor. And they've completed over a billion dollars worth of projects across the West Coast. So um, very excited to, to bring the team to Brawley. Mm -hmm. <coughs> get this to go, there we go. So what you're looking at in this slide is a, an example of what will be produced. Uh, by Indie Dwell. Indie Dwell is a modular manufacturer of units that are assembled together to create multifamily housing. So um, some modular manufacturers you've, you might have heard of build with containers. Indie Dwell will be building instead with light gauge steel. And the end product that you'll see driving down the road uh, will look something like what you have in this picture. And each of these modules will be constructed from start to finish inside of the factory. As you can appreciate, those are jobs, start to finish. It starts with cutting the light gauge steel, it ends with wrapping this module up, setting it on a trailer, and shipping it off to its destinations. Why Brawley? Why did they choose Brawley? Because Brawley is so well located, right? Los Angeles, San Diego, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Yuma, we all know but it wasn't on the map. Um, it was brought to the map because I was flying back and forth to Boise, Idaho, where they're headquartered, uh, doing due diligence on Indie Dwell because we are sourcing three of our new buildings, this is when I say we, I say Decor Corporation, um, from Indie Dwell. Indie Dwell will be building these out of their Pueblo factory. And I couldn't help but notice, you know, it's pretty far. Have you thought about coming to Southern California? And they said, well, you know, uh, we would, but we just don't have any local contacts. So I raised my hand and I said, well, I, you've got to come see Brawley. Mm -hmm. Brought them out a little over a year ago. Then the pandemic kicked up in full swing. And um, obviously, you know, that we had, we had to simmer for a while. But over the last six months or so, I mean, we, they're on board. Very, very excited about it. We even applied uh, for a Cal Competes grant, where, where, which the new company was awarded. So be a, the operator will be a new company, California-based business, and owned by, partially owned by the employees. We're really excited about that. 
Um, some of the other benefits of building with like a steel modular is in a typical wood construction multifamily building, you can build four stories. Well, with like edge steel, you can go up to six. That's critical, especially in the urban areas where you know I'm trying to build affordable housing because density is everything. And that's it's a tiny, tiny picture, but you know, an example of their product, right? They they build really high quality products, um, like I said across the United States. This, this would be their fourth factory. They're also <laughs> building factories in Virginia and um, elsewhere in, in the country. So very excited to bring IndieDwell to Brawley, and especially because of the economic development benefits. Um, excited because it helps Decor Corporation have local sourcing, right? But it also speaks to their mission as a company, which is to be located in rural areas that are in dire need of economic development. They recognize that these big industrial buildings, it's expensive to locate them in an urban center because land's more expensive, buildings, you know, higher rent. Um, it's a win-win-win all around. It really is. They were so impressed by IVC. We did a tour of IVC. Um, we have talked to the county about them sourcing and, and, and helping assist with the labor um, training, you know, that'll be necessary so that we can hit the ground running. And um, this really will be a public-private, you know, partnership collaboration across all three sectors, the nonprofit with Decor Corporation, you know, the, the public sector with the help of IVC supporting the labor, and, and uh, the County of Imperial has said that, you know, they, they would be, um, like to support with, with some of the training, the uh, dollars, and obviously, you know, your support here as we go through the, the process. Um, as Tom mentioned, we have already received that approval for site plan. We hope to submit it to the building department uh, very shortly here and within the next few weeks. And this project is happening. Mm -hmm. So proud about that. Um, this next project, though, originally, I was hopeful, Indie Dwell could be located there. <coughs> for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. that was not possible. Um, that being said, I'm, you know, I'm happy any trial is still coming. So the Rancho Los Lagos project goes back to when I was you know, a young child here in the city of Brawley. <laughs> um, dad, John Benson, whose name was well known in these halls, and his partner, Jim Jamison, acquired the property in the 80s. And it was always known that the path of growth of Brawley, or thought that the path of growth for Brawley would be toward Imperial, right? That is in the, the extension of, of that growth. And I'm sure Dad had, you know, had in mind something along those lines. It's really still, it's still farm ground, though. And we've continued to, to farm it. Um, I started working on the entitlement efforts for this project just after uh, finishing my master's in planning and, and business. And very proud to say that we were successful in entitling this entire specific plan area. Uh, in 2012, where it received its improve, approvals for a tentative track map, the EIR was approved, and most importantly, the specific plan was approved. Um, and in that process, you know, we always were hopeful, oh, maybe City of Brawley, but you know, this is such a such a significant project and a well-balanced project. You know, it's fine continuing on through the county. What was necessary next was forming a community services district, which we applied for and started with LAFCO in 2018. Uh, all, everything was, was going along well until we learned of a new state law. And that state law, SP 1263, requires that if you are proposing a new water treatment facility within three miles of an existing facility, you first need to demonstrate that the existing facility um, does it, you know, it is unfeasible. And why did the state law get passed? Because in large public infrastructure, economies of scale is best, right? They know they've seen small communities across the state where they have duplicate, duplicative uh, water infrastructure, treatment centers, et cetera. And um, it, it obviously seems to make sense where you have economies of scale by pooling your resources together and not duplicating. Um, so for the last three years, 
we've been in discussion with some of your staff and uh, I think made really great prog progress on conversations around how that connection perhaps could be made. Um, and then just this last summer, several members of, of this council, as well as even several members of the County Board of Supervisors, asked the question, why aren't you annexing? And that's really what brings us here today, right? Is, is to continue to, to, to open up that conversation a little further <coughs> and let you know that as this project has evolved over time, clearly um, we feel very strongly that we're stronger together. And as stewards of the land now for almost 40 years, we want to do what's in the best interest of not, not just the property owners, because it, but more importantly, the surrounding community, because it has to be economically sustainable. And services are critical. Without the services, this is just farm ground. And when IndyDwell came to Brawley, I asked them, I was hopeful that they would go to Rancho Los Lagos. They love the site, but they couldn't go there because it didn't have services. So how many more businesses you know, do, do I have to find another site for, right, um, when Rancho Los Lagos really is an ideal business park, as well as, you, we, we, we'll see, has lots of wonderful elements, which I'm going to invite Tom DeBose back up to speak to um, a few more slides that we have where we actually go into the details of why we think and want to show the, share with the public, the Rancho Los Lagos specific plan is unique, um, really intended to generate economic development, first and foremost, so it's sustainable economically, and create a wonderful extension of, of uh, the city of Raleigh. Move that next one, please. So just a quick overview of the Rancho Los Lagos project. As Laura had said, it's been approved in the County of Imperial. If we're to bring it forward to attempt to annex into the city of Brawley, that specific plan would have to have some modifications to it under the eyes of Gordon Gaste in the planning department to modify it so that it would fit to the city of Brawley standards. But it's also creating its own zone. And it's going to create that zone that's going to speak to some of the higher density that I think you heard about last Thursday in your presentation about fiscal impacts and long-term management, where we create a little bit better and smarter density so that the long run pays off better than maybe it has in the past. So it's a very diverse project. It's going to have an awful lot of open space, open space that would be managed by an HOA, so that gets off the uh, headache books of uh, the city of Brawley. 50% uh, of this land area is residential, 18 of it is commercial. Commercial being support commercial for the project, support commercial for the community, but also medical. We have a very fine hospital up here in Brawley, and we want to be able to add to that with a senior component. Uh, some schools and quite a bit of open space, but again, much of that under an HOA. Um, this will be a walkable, recreational, senior, friendly community for the city of Brawley that we think will not only add to what the needs are, but we're going to speak in just a couple of minutes about the why now. Next, please. We want to start this project in the, the areas that both are most convenient to attach to with services, which would be up in the northeast corner, as well as the area of, I really think, need. As Laura just spoke, the industrial park that's adjacent to Dogwood between Dogwood Road and the railroad tracks was an ideal location for Indy Dwell, except there's no sewer and water there. You don't have a lot of industrial left except for the area where Indy Dwell is going today that has those services. And we have the ability to provide another 100 acres for, again, the why now that I'll explain a little bit more later. 
but as businesses grow, as the businesses in the North End are going to grow, some of those support businesses are going to look for a place to go. And having utilities at this industrial park within Rancho Los Lagos early on would be a big benefit. Also, we're starting on the far east so that everything else remaining out to the west can continue to be farmed, not have to be maintained by city services or anything else, so that we could start on the east, start where the jobs would be created, start with housing product that doesn't exist today. If you can go to the next slide, please. And move from the east over to the west. It has an 18-hole golf course that the golf course could remain as 18 holes or it could redesign with some uh, playing both directions, nine holes, with some lake uh, amenities. We're, we're open to that. But one of the other features within the Rancho Los Lagos would be tourism. And I'm here to tell you today that one of the five major hotel chains in the world has been here, a representative of that has been here to Brawley. And they're looking at two sites. One of them is near term, and that would be on Benson property up in the north end. And again, we won't go into a lot of detail other than there is a very strong interest. But recently at their show in Phoenix, this land plan was laid out to that hotel chain and they were really excited about the probability of a resort. So we're talking about one of the five major hotel chains in the world. They're not anywhere else in Imperial Valley, so that starts to eliminate those who are and aren't, who has expressed a very strong interest in coming today, both at a location on the north end by the Del Rio Country Club, as well as coming as this project would be to develop in the future uh, as a resort area. Um, next slide, please. This first phase would have some units offered right out the gate that aren't mapped today. Now, some of those type lots are available in a couple of the other plans here, but they're not yet being built. And this would open up some additional housing, little higher density. The, the, the facts that you were listening to last week about, you know, a street, you know, costs so much to maintain, we would put more units on that street so it starts to balance the books a little bit better. Hopefully with some consideration of ordinance changes, maybe we narrow those streets up just a little. Everybody gets a break on that, a break on the cost of the developer, a break on the overall maintenance cost of the city. And the other one that nobody really thinks much about is the slowing down of the traffic within a neighborhood community. <clears throat> so you could see a lot mix here of the various types of attached and detached lots, some multifamily, uh, a few larger lots that would go across the railroad tracks from the industrial park. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the why now. And Laura talked about Indy Dwell coming to Brawley because of the proximity to the market. In Imperial Valley, we have an excellent proximity to market. I like to tell people when I'm wearing my IVEDC economic development hat that you know all our lives we accepted the fact that we were in the middle of nowhere. That's no longer true. We're in the middle of a lot. And these opportunities that are coming to the North End with all of the geothermal that is being planned to expand, and why? because the California Public Utility Commission has carved out a thousand megawatts that must come from either geothermal energy or biomass. Companies like Cal Energy or the Berkshire Hathaway, who has a pretty large footprint, mm -hmm. is talking about doubling their capacity. Can you imagine what that means in not just the construction jobs, but the permanent jobs? Along with that, the mineral mining. Again, this is a lot of talk, a lot of talk that's getting very loud and action being taken by some of the recent agreements being signed with some of our geothermal companies. What you haven't heard a lot about yet is the biofuels. And there are biofuel, biofuel projects up in the north end in the drawing stages, and we can't divulge who those are right now. 
I've got a couple that we're working on out at Mesquite Lake. You've got California Ethanol and Power, who's had a long track to get here, but they're you know about to break ground. Biofuels in Imperial County, because of our renewable energy, our resource of water, our proximity to market, um, it's going to start filling a lot of new opportunity. And then, of course, lastly, the inland port with conversations that continue on today now with the port of Long Beach and the port of LA and the viability that continues to grow. What am I saying here in summary? The new job center of Imperial Valley is going to be in the North End. This is an opportunity now for people like me who live here in Brawley, who drive to El Centro, maybe will not be driving south anymore. They're going to be driving north. I could tell you that every one of these companies who is looking to come in, whether they're geothermal, whether it's mineral mining, whether it's an add-on to the mineral mining, they're all wanting to know where their people are going to live. This is an opportunity for Brawley to not only advertise the fact that you're ready for business, you're ready to grow Rancho Los Lagos with some industrial that would allow for the support services that would come along with that, but really now create the need of retail growth because a guy like me who drives to El Centro, maybe I stop at Target on the way home. If I'm driving north, I'm not stopping at the Target in El Centro anymore. I'm not saying Target's coming to Brawley, but if we start creating these new jobs and people living in the North End, I'm really just saying to you that this is an opportunity for the North End in the city of Brawley to start to shine. So Indy Dwell and Rancho Los Lagos would be bringing in and creating the area for a lot of this to happen. With Indy Dwell, as Laura said, breaking ground here, we hope to get a grading plan here within the next couple of three months. We're very close. We've been working with the city staff and uh, we're very close to being able to submit those plans. We believe Rancho Los Lagos brings that opportunity of new tax base, generating growth, and attracting new families. Business creates business. When I mentioned last week about an incentive for your infill, new business coming in maybe creates the incentive for something on the inside to fill up. It creates that opportunity. We believe that the Rancho Los Lagos industrial area could provide a spot for wastewater treatment. Right now, it's a bit of a bottleneck trying to get everything to go up to your treatment plant without a new trunk line. The topography of Brawley falls south on the south end instead of all going north. And so the Rancho Los Lagos industrial project could provide that as well. What are we going to have to do other than to convince you we're going to have to create a fiscal impact analysis. We're going to have to update the city's service area plan. We're going to have to submit an application. Uh, we're going to have to take the specific plan and work with Gordon to make some of the modifications so it meets Brawley's uh, needs and, uh, and standards. And with all of that, we hope that we can, in doing all of that, it could be back in front of you with all of the right information that would allow you to say, yes, this makes sense for us. The last thing that we wanted to do with our time, and we appreciate the time you've given us, is to really also say that we support the city of Brawley in its request for a utility tax extension. Now is not the time to further handicap us. We've had one arm behind our back for a very long time. Not renewing that utility tax would be taking the other one right at the wrong time where a lot of this new growth is about to happen. And so you have the Benson family's support, our support, to see the citizens of Brawley to find a way to extend this utility tax, because this is now not a time to take us behind. I'd like to say that as a guy who grew up in Brawley, you know, there's a lot of pride of us here, and we have what we used to have, I remember as a young child, seemed like the best of everything. I don't know that that's exactly true, and it's not been due to a lack of effort on your part. But we really, I think all working together, have a chance now to get somewhere. And the extension of this utility tax, is, it's our plea to the voters of Brawley that they would see fit to extend that, because there are 
some exciting times ahead, and some of those are already in the permit stages. So with that, we are here to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Laura. Any, any questions from Council? Mr. Mayor, I know it's um, public comment, right? So, I, I, you know, just to be clear, um, that was there was a ton of good information, obviously, in, in, in that. And uh, Mr. DuBose, thank you for that. And, and um, certainly the Benson family and Laura coming up and giving the presentation. So I, I took a ton of notes. I think everyone was. And there has been some conversation. But I think what was really beneficial here today was really hearing it all together um, as, as really one um, succinct presentation of multiple projects. And clearly there's long-term as well as immediate, you know, kind of short-term um, projects in the queue. So obviously, you know, all exciting. And I know staff um, is fully engaged. Um, so I just look forward, you know, for future presentations as well as uh, conversations. Certainly, I have a bunch of questions, but I want to save them, you know, again, you know, for fear we're, we're in the public comment period. Not, don't want to ask too many questions. So um, those are just my comments. So um, and and again, and appreciate the mention of uh, Measure U because uh, that's a different topic, but that's very immediate as well. So thank you, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Donnie. Anyone else? I uh, just thank you for the information. Uh, I was here during the last presentation, and it was very intriguing. And uh, that's the first I had heard of it. Um, definitely very excited to see what else comes with it. Um, uh, but that said, I'll save my questions again for, for another time. Just I, I do appreciate the presentation. I know we've met uh, here in the recent past. And so I, I certainly uh, I'm well acquainted with your project. And it's been on, obviously, come before council um, in, in times past but I can tell you I mean just the way things are moving with this council with the city staff development within the city I think just it's an exciting time there's that I, I would say this and maybe I, I hope I'm not speaking um, too far off base here but if there is a time where this can be proposed now is it so you know it's it's a good time to listen and present and uh, you know it's exciting to see that there there are um, some positive things that are happening, not just in the valley, but near Brawley. And uh, I'm excited about it, so yeah. thank you. It looks like a great project. Um, I think we are certainly uh, have questions, but I think we'll hold those. Um, I, I think we're supportive as a council to economic development and specifically projects in the realm of Brawley and the North End. We want to be supportive of the entire North End. And I think this would be a positive for more than just Brawley in the North End, but for the whole area. Um, also, I like the location. Uh, on a personal level, I do like the location of the project. I think it's, it's a great area for that and uh, for our future development also, because I think Brawley is going to head out that area. Any, you know, we're headed out that way anyway, I think, with Walmart and everything else that we have going on. There are some housing projects that are heading out that area too. Uh, so um, I think it's a, it's a positive project, and we look forward to working with you on the project and certainly with you, Tom, and, and the Benson family. So thank you very much for the presentation. And I will share that Mr. Benson was my mentor on council. A tremendous amount of respect for him and, uh, you know, just a, a good person overall. So just thought I'd share that. Yes. Thank you. And, and Tom, you mentioned last week's presentation from Urban 3, the economic analysis. And, and um, I know that that, is, that was some, some kind of groundbreaking information for us to, to receive and absorb, and that's going to take some time to process through all of that, and I, I know there's more information that we need to get from Urban 3 and from the county, but, but having that information in front of us as we get um, development plans like this, goals um, and projects is, is very helpful to integrate those two, you know, what's, for what's going to be best for the future of the City of Brawley. So we appreciate you, you all coming and, and uh, presenting these projects to us. We're excited about Indy Dwell. That's going to be, that's going to be very helpful. Mr. Mayor, just, just as a question, just uh, maybe more to um, our city manager. Um, Tom, I think you framed up kind of that there's several next steps because there's multiple projects, but just taking it one step at a time. Um, in terms of council, what's, I heard of, you know, the grading plan, I, I think, for submission um, to kind of get that, you know, that, in, I think the Indie Well project, right? Yeah, that, that's, I think that's immediate and, and exciting. And then even on a broader scale, Mayor, as you just mentioned, um, the recent Urban 3 study and, and really getting us an opportunity to see how that kind of overlays and, and obviously getting with Gordon's expertise and, you know, talking about the long-term picture 
Um, I, I think it would be neat if maybe somewhere down the road here we have even an econ development, um, you know, workshop or spectra or some time that we can dedicate to. Um, I think we normally do that in the beginning of the year and call it the strategy meeting. So maybe something timed around there, um, if that's not too far off for that kind of picture. I know there's things that have to happen, but I think the holidays are coming up. So as soon as we come around to the new year, maybe some consideration for that to have a much broader um, economic development slash strategic uh, conversation would be exciting, you know, to do. Yes. Michael Bracken is going to be doing the economic analysis for the project. <clears throat> We look forward to Michael working with Tyler and your finance department and providing you the very best information so that, again, you feel comfortable uh, as this process on Rancho Los Lagos goes forward. But with a project that's already going to be going into the ground, creating some jobs, and providing some immediate benefit to Brawley right away, again, thanks to the Benson family and their bringing Indy Dwell into this community. Thank you know, a couple of us are here full time, and Laura's uh, here part time, and phone call away, so we're all available at any time. Is, okay. is there a reason that you didn't bring Steve up? Is it no? We're, we just <laughs> want to go with that. <laughs> we were trying to be positive? good stewards no. of your time. <laughs> yeah, very good. Right? Right? They just wanted to keep thank it positive. You. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> be nice. All right. Kidding. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. I look up to you, like literally, <laughs> look up to you. Right? Like, look up to you. Okay. Um, item three is the consent agenda. There were there was a change made to three C. It was pulled, Mayor. It was pulled. Yep. So is there a a motion to approve the consent agenda as modified? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? All right. Item four, city manager report. Uh, <clears throat> nothing in particular at this time except uh, to uh, Council Member Wharton's um, inquiry. The both, both projects, we've been working real closely with, with uh, that group. Uh, Tom and I, Mr. DeBose and I, we've uh, spent a lot of time together, and my, my wife is real appreciative of that. Um, but uh, we're making it, the, the Indy Well specifically is, is a lot close, closer than it is uh, far away from getting completed yeah. and of course we're continuing to talk on the other project as well and, and when there's updates to be uh, made to the council we'll bring those back other than that I don't have anything okay thank you Tyler <laughs> item five is a public hearing discussion and potential action to adopt the city of Brawley housing element update slash negative declaration resolution and associated ordinances for 2021 to 2029 this will be presented by Gordon Gaist, our Community Services Director. Backup is on pages 37 through, looks like 102. Gordon. It's mine. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I had it and, yeah. I, and I was vaccinated, so I think my antibodies are good. <laughs> good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor, Council Members. It's that time again, housing element update. Uh, since the last time we've been on an eight-year cycle, when I first got here, we we're on five-year cycles. Uh, we're on eight-year cycles now, which is good. We don't have to do it as much, but it doesn't mean you have to do less work. You just got to do three more years of research and, and updates. Uh, but it's good that we don't have to do it every every five years anymore. Um, you know, these start basically after the last adoption. Any new legislature that goes through, we keep track of and what kind of things that we need to add to the next element uh, through all our seminars and just, you know, following the, the legislation. You know, it's all part of our job to keep up on these, uh, these new laws. Uh, so this uh, uh, particular element, like it said, will go through 2021 through 2029. Uh, this includes uh, the environmental for it, which is a negative declaration, same thing we did last time. Uh, it's, a, it's basically a policy document uh, for it, it just keep the neg, neg deck allows us to for especially for infill projects since it's not showing any environmental impacts uh, so we don't have to do anything further. It can accelerate uh, a lot of the infill projects. The associated ordinances are ones like, again, these have happened in these last eight years. These are like some of the more 
uh, the ones that have been around a, little, a few more years, and uh, we've already been following these uh, uh, state laws. Uh, you know, our ordinance is, has been out of compliance. So for the uh, accessory dwelling unit ordinance, which used to be called second units or, you know, granny flats, uh, now known as accessory dwelling units, uh, is updated to reflect what, we, like I said, we've had been doing uh, uh, in terms of building permits and planning since it was uh, passed by the state. The same thing with the density bonus uh, ordinance, which they decide to change every uh, two to three years. <laughs> so uh, on that one, what we'd like to do, w instead of putting the percentages in there and making it such a, a long ordinance, uh, we just uh, kind of shorten it to reflect whatever the current state law is kind of keeps us from having to come back here all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, again, uh, some of these things uh, have been paid for by, well, actually, pretty much all of these things have been paid for by grants. We started out with the SB2 grant, which did a lot of the technical updates uh, and, and some of the, the ordinance updates, the ones that we needed to do, the ADU one and the density bonus. It also, uh, uh, is helping to pay for our environmental justice element, <clears throat> which we've been doing internally. We haven't had any consultant help on that. They didn't give us that much money for it, but we're doing that. That will actually be at Planning Commission tomorrow for recommendation to council. Um, and these, gr th this particular grant uh, actually uh, is to be closed out by the end of the year, so these things just need to be done by the end of the year. Uh, there's a few more uh, other zoning ordinance updates you'll probably see coming in the following year as the LEAP grant, which is the second grant, will be winding down through the end of next year that uh, are mostly more administrative. You'll see some updates to uh, definitions in the ordinance. Uh, just it's a more of a cleanup. Probably nothing really that that's a big uh, policy change. Um, again, like I said, you know, whenever there's a new law that comes out, you know, from the state, you know, and once it, you know, becomes in effect on whatever date that is, uh, we have to follow it regardless. So uh, I would like to let our consultant to give a very brief presentation also, if if you will, okay. and then we would be uh, happy to answer any questions and then uh, have a public hearing, if that's okay with the mayor. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Hamby and the council members. It's lovely to be in Brawley. I love Brawley. The process uh, for the current six cycle housing element is the same as it was for the fifth cycle housing element, which was adopted in 2013. Following the Brawley Planning Commission meeting on June 2nd, the six cycle housing element draft was submitted to the State Housing Community Development Department, or HCD. HCD had 60 days to review the draft housing element, and there was a, a telephone conversation with the HCD reviewer who was assigned to the city and that occurred on July 19th, 2021. The HCD written comments were received from them on 8-13-2021, and we responded to the HCD comments from uh, having a public hearing draft. The Planning Commission uh, public hearing included a virtual meeting component, which was held on September 8th, and the city planning director and the consultant, that was me, provided a staff presentation, which was an overview of the 2021 through 2029 housing element that incorporated and addressed the state housing and community development department's comment letter, which was dated August 30th. From that draft of the 2021, 2029 housing element, that draft was submitted to HCD on June 14th. Um, the planning director, Gordon Gosti, commented uh, that four items were under consideration by the planning commission, and they moved for them to come to you today. 
uh, along with the entire draft. Uh, the recommendation uh, to the City Council was uh, to adopt the 2021 housing element and of course the environmental analysis of the housing element and um, the ADU ordinance, which Gordon discussed, and the um, density bonus ordinance. As a result of the HCD comments and the response to the comments, we updated the draft. And uh, as an example of a few programs that were added, um, program 2.10, the farmer worker housing program was added, program 6.1, at-risk housing preservation program, program 7.1, the energy conservation program. Other examples of the changes are an additional data on housing prices and rents. That's something they had in the comment letter. Additional information on processing timelines, the adoption date of the building code, and the code enforcement process. If the city council adopts the housing element update, the negative deck, the resolution, and the associated ordinances, then the housing element will be transmitted to HCD for their final review and certification. This is extremely important. And the certification is also called substantial compliance. And um, if you go on the HC, HCD website, you can see how other um, large jurisdictions have gone through the process and have been certified. So that's what you're looking for when you apply for all of these grants and all kinds of things that happen within your community. One of the first questions they ask on any of the applications are, do you have a certified housing element? It's very important. And I'd be glad to answer any questions along with Gordon. Any questions? Um, I did have one question. You mentioned a number of amendments that were added. Is that was that after the planning commission uh, approved no. the, the document? No. No, that was that was um, predated there. Predated no, we, we went that. through HCD first. We had we, we wanted to make sure that what we were presenting was going to be in compliance. Otherwise, yeah, it'd be a waste of time. Right. Yeah. So, right, so, so you know, we wanted to meet their minimum requirements to to uh, make sure that what we brought to public hearing was appropriate. Okay. So we brought that to the planning commission, and there were a number of um, additions that they wanted done, and so that's what we're bringing to you. Okay. Mine might just be more of a general question when we do go through this. Is there? Um, this is always the, these revisions or you know uh, amendments and updates that are made to various parts of the housing element. Does it have impact on existing? Is there retroactive consequences by by any chance? With you know, I mean, taking something as narrow as you were talking about, you know, accessory housing or yes. additional. So yeah, well, well for accessory like the ADU. Okay, so um, you know, in the past there was certain uh, say. Uh, setback requirements for an ADU. Mm -hmm. um, those have been relaxed some by the state. So yes, mm -hmm. uh, it, they are, you know, any, well, I mean, if somebody, you know, already has one, it's gonna be in compliance anyway. But if somebody, you know, new comes in, they're gonna be able to take the advantage of, different. of the yeah. extra two feet of setback mm -hmm. uh, requirement that they can have. Yeah, I appreciate that. It, that. That's a question part of this meeting that came up, so I just yeah. wanted yeah, to make sure it's kind there's of There's a, a lot of stuff it. changing, and I know yeah. that there's, you've probably heard of the new laws that are coming in, SB9, SB10. SB10 really doesn't affect us. That's more mm -hmm. for, for larger cities and that have transit-oriented development. But the SB9 that allows you to subdivide your lots into smaller lots, mm -hmm. um, like the uh, uh, Chris Nee actually gave, gave me some information, and, and uh, it doesn't look like that's something that most cities or people. Would that SB9 well, actually well, apply to our yes, city? Yeah, that, that will, that they'll take advantage of because it really uh, probably mm -hmm. doesn't really benefit you that much because, you know, you got to go through the process of subdividing it and then, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, the building mm -hmm. of it and everything. So it, it's probably cheaper just to do ADUs um, than it is to, to actually do that. 
So I, I, I'll, I'll follow up with you later, but I did read up on that SB9, and I, I thought that we didn't qualify for that. No, it's SB10 we don't qualify. It's SB10. Okay. Yeah, right. Got it. Yeah, that one has, that usually has, it, it has to be like you are within a, an area of transit. Transit. Yeah. That, that has a, a regularly scheduled, you know, the thing like that. It, that. That's more focused towards places like L.A. and San Diego. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah, know, I'll, I'll follow up with you during, during the week because I did have a question on but, SB9. But SB9 is the one that has about. the one that, that is uh, regarding the, the, you know, subdividing of, of a lot down to, 1,200 square feet with then, proper access. You know, there's still other things. And multifamily units on each yeah, lot yeah, to improve it. Yeah. No, yeah, the SB10 is the one where you can put 20 units in one lot. Ah, that's, okay. the one we, we, that's the one that doesn't apply to us. Okay. Okay. This Got one it. is only four. Yeah, SB9 is the four. Right. Right. All right. Okay. Any other questions or comments from mm -hmm. council? Okay, at this time I'm going to open the public hearing and invite public comment, questions. Seeing none. Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And before us, we have three different items. One is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Brawley, California, amending the housing element of the general plan and adoption of the negative declaration. The backup is on pages 92 and 93. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? All right, that item carries. The second item is an Ordinance of the City Council of the City of Brawley, California, amending Article 2 to Chapter 27, Article 12, Section 27.201 of the Brawley Municipal Code to amend the second unit section with the accessory dwelling unit ordinance alternative. Backup is on pages 94 to 98. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the ordinance as presented by the mayor. Okay. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? The third item is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Brawley, California, amending Article 2 to Chapter 27, Article 21 of the Brawley Municipal Code to amend the Density Bonus Program. And the backup is on pages 99 to 102. And I'll make a motion to approve the ordinance as presented by the Mayor. I'll second it. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? That item carries. And that concludes item five. We'll move on to item six. This is the utility user tax contingency plan study session. We're going to review and discuss potential operational impacts and cost saving measures identified by the City of Raleigh's executive team should the November 2021 utility user tax measure U not be approved by voters. This will be presented by our city manager, Tyler Salcido, and our finance director, Carla Romero. Backup is on page 103. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the presentation tonight incorporates the collective input of the city's executive team. We started this process uh, with a five-hour meeting in, uh, in this room on, about, uh, on August 30th uh, to determine how we could achieve a $2 million reduction in expenses in the event that the uh, measure does not pass. The, uh, the conversations were difficult and represented real impacts to the operations and to fellow coworkers alike and to the ability to deliver quality services in a timely manner to our community. After this exercise, uh, we summarized our findings into a compre comprehensive document, then quantified each decision using the current budget that was adopted, making cuts line by line. Our finance director is presenting these efforts this evening. Uh, Carla and I are here to answer any questions during or after the presentation. So I will, for that, turn it over to our finance director, Carla Romero. Thank you, Tyler, and good evening, council members, colleagues, and those listening uh, here tonight and online as well. Um, before I start my presentation, I just want to tell you that this is one of the most difficult presentations I have had to make in my 16 years of working for local government. The reason it's very difficult for me is because many of you know I grew up here in this city. 
I went to school here, you know, K through 12th, graduated from BUHS. I'm very proud, just as other people mentioned, to be a Brawley resident. I bought a house here in 2005, and I always kept it because I always wanted to come back home. I'm very proud to serve this community. I'm very honored to be your finance director, but I will tell you that this is one of the most difficult things I've had to put together and have to deliver tonight. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and get started. I want to start off with just a timeline of uh, what got us here today, right? We, I started uh, part-time in February, um, and in April hit the ground running and presented to you um, a decision to bring forward a special election ballot measure for our utility user tax. Since then, you have adopted three resolutions which were submitted to the county in order to get the tax measure on the ballot for November the 2nd. After that, we did go over a draft ordinance, and we've had several meetings, six uh, since April, to discuss the utility user tax. And so our November 2nd election is around the corner. People have their ballot measures already. Some have probably already filled them out. And the voting polls will be open on November the 2nd as well. So some of these beginning slides you have seen before, but I just want to reiterate what the history of the taxes and the importance of the taxes to the city. The tax was first adopted in 1991. Um, it has passed through several ordinances and then several ballot measures since then and has always been supported by the voters. The rate has varied, um, has been as high as 5%. It's currently at 4%. And the tax measure as it was is written would retain the 4% rate. That would not change. It does currently expire in, on May 31st of 2021. And so again, that's, uh, sorry, 2022. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so that is why we had to put that on a special election for November um, before that expiration date. Uh, the tax is used to provide essential city services. So we're talking police, fire, parks, community facilities, libraries, recreation programs, and we'll touch on these throughout the presentation in several manners. The annual revenue is currently uh, budgeted at $1.9 million. That represents 9% of our total general fund revenues, or about 17% or of just the tax revenue. And I have some specific slides regarding that as well. The UUT is really important because it's 100% collected and remitted to the city. Uh, not all of our taxes are, and we'll discuss that as well. So it provides us a lot of local control for the, lo the resources that we receive. Um, and just to mention, there are other local UUTs um, in place, utility user taxes. The city of Hopeville has one at 5%, and the other nearer city with um, about the same population is Desert Hot Springs, and their utility user tax rate is 7%. So it's not, a, not a, an ordinary tax to have. So how does the city of Raleigh compare to those other agencies? And here's always where I throw a word of caution, right? Every agency is different. You're my third agency that I have worked for, and every one and every budget year is different. I always think I got it down, and then there's a curveball like COVID that happens or um, a new service that the city wants to implement. And so... I was really excited to come to work for the city of Raleigh because we are a full service city. So what that means is that the city itself does not contract out for all of the services or for hardly for any in our case. We have our own police department, fire department, airport, water, wastewater, library, parks and rec program. Um, and again, that utility user tax helps sustain those, uh, some of those efforts. There are 162 utility user taxes throughout the state of California. They do range as low as 1% or as high as 11%. And again, that's because every city is different. Every city has different revenue sources, and every city um, has different priorities as well. The UUT rate is applied to water, wastewater, electricity, gas, cable television, and landlines. <clears throat> and most other agencies also include telecommunication, cell phone, or internet-based services, which is what our proposed utility user tax would also include as well. Um, so if approved, um, may, many people might ask, well, how are my utility bills going to change? For the majority of those bills noted there in, in green, there is no change. The tax is already 4%. It's already being charged. This is not a new tax. The tax rate is not changing. So for many, there will be no fiscal impact if the utility user tax is passed. 
Um, in the future, the city would try to incorporate some of those modernized services that are added to the, that would be added to the ordinance um, if the ballot measure were approved. And over time, we would be able to potentially add cell phones and streaming video services um, along the way. So again, just to reiterate, these are some of the services um, that the city provides. Those in green are enterprise funds, um, but you can consider a business uh, for the city. Water, wastewater, and airport, they have their own fees set by rates um, that are supported uh, completely independently from the general fund. The general fund, uh, those in blue, so police, fire, parks, rec, libraries, senior center administration, finance, information technology, human resources, planning, engineering, development, animal control, building maintenance, graffiti abatement. Um, those are all services that are supported with this tax. And I'll give you some examples of what that means. Then we also have contract services. So these are the two contract services that we have. We have the trash and street sweeping um, with Allied, and then we also have the Imperial Valley Transit Services. Those are the only two that the city itself does not operate and manage for its residents. So let's talk a little bit more about just the revenue itself that the city gets, all of the general fund revenue. Remember, the general fund is our most flexible resource, uh, revenue resource that the city has. We're able to use it for um, a variety of uh, priorities as the council uh, sees fit in the community. And so when we're talking about our tax revenue there, it's that big blue pie, piece of the pie chart right on the right-hand side. That's 63% of our revenue comes from taxes. And the next slide is going to tell you a little bit more about what those taxes are. Um, and so that's the portion that we're going to be focusing on tonight. This is that 63% that broken down. And again, that blue portion there the seven, is 17%, 1.9 million. That is the piece of the pie that would potentially be eliminated if the utility user tax does not pass. There's other taxes the city receives. Our sales tax rate at the city of Brawley is 7.75%, but the city only retains 1% of that total 7.75%. The state keeps 6%, and the Transportation Commission um, fees, there's two of them, it's 075 uh, Carla, if I may interrupt real quick, uh, just to add up, add to Carla's point previously about uh, uh, different agencies have different tax uh, revenue mechanisms. Well, in our valley here, the city of Calexico and the city of El Centro have higher tax rates than we do in Embarale for sales tax. Yeah, they're so, sitting now at what, 8.25? 8.25, where we're at 7.75, of which only 1%, Carla's, I'm sure, going to get to back to us and that additional between the 775 and the 825 and the other agencies goes directly back to them. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a important important mm -hmm. note that we should consider. You know, we're about to ask that question. Yeah. Part. In other words, there's other forms of maybe it's not a utility user tax, yeah. but there's other forms of local tax. Thank you for that clarification. And, and that, right. that dollar figure is much larger, too. Yeah. You know. yeah. So those are called transaction and use taxes, and those apply to, like, online sales, um, and they also would apply to um, delivery of service and to anything purchased in stores. But you're right, the city of Raleigh only has the base state sales tax 1%, not the transaction and use tax. Mm -hmm. But that would be a potential additional revenue source for the city. Uh, for property taxes, the city, uh, for every uh, dollar a resident pays, the city retains 22 cents of that dollar, comes back to the city in order, and is used to fund general, general services of the city. The school districts keep 59% of the property taxes, the county keeps 12, and special districts uh, keep 7%. There's, I think, four of them. And then again, the utility user tax rate is 4%, and the city is able to retain 100% of that revenue when it comes in. That's why we, we know it's very important. So the general fund revenue reductions, if the UUT is not approved, what are they? We talked about the 1.9, but there are other resources that would also be eliminated because we wouldn't be able to provide all the services the city currently has. Mm. And so those revenues um, are noted on the right-hand side. They're minimal, but they should also be considered when we're making our reductions. We're talking about swimming pool fees, recreational programs, uh, rec league fees. Our interest would decrease that we are generating because our revenue is decreasing. And our potential grant funding, we may not be able to um, 
get all of the grants because some of them require matching funding and so we would also potentially lose some matching, um, some grant funding as well for some operations. And so what we're talking about tonight is really a reduction in revenue of $2,069,000. And so that's the target number that we'll be going over tonight. So let's talk a little bit about, well, you know, um, how can a city increase revenues? We were talking about it a little bit a while ago. How easy is it, right? When you're a business, you charge a little bit more. Um, but how does a city do it? So the general taxes of a city, anytime you want a new tax or you want to change the tax, just like we're doing now, we want to change it, we want to modernize it, and we want to extend it, it requires voter approval. It's not something that you and I can decide on a meeting um, and it just comes to fruition. Remember the first slide we talked about, we started in April. So that is a big in Denver. It's a, it requires a lot of services, a lot of time and energy um, on our part in order to get that even to the voters for, for consideration. And then our grants, um, they're not always guaranteed, right? They fluctuate in size and availability from year to year, depending on what the state's priorities are, or the federal government um, is able to fund. And so we can't really count on those every single year in order to sustain our operations. The city also can't charge more than it costs to provide a service. So we can't make a profit on the programs or services that we provide. Uh, but we can increase those fees. But to increase those fees, it requires a fee study and city council approval. And a fee study basically says, OK, how many staff does it take? How long does it take staff to do that? How much do you pay current staff? How much does a paper cost? How many um, hours is this? How many is And so we quantify all of that. Usually a third party consultant will do that, present the findings, and you decide, do you want to do 100% full cost recovery, which means I charge the maximum amount to recuperate all of my cost, or do we want to alleviate that by charging less? And I'll give you some examples next as, as well. So let's talk about what the general fund tax provides and what it supports for our city. I have two examples of this. The first one is our recreation and Lion Center activities. So on the left, you see the revenue that is collected. Some of this revenue was mentioned earlier that would potentially uh, be reduced uh, if the utility user tax were to not pass. And on the right, you see the expenses. So our total revenue is about 154,000, but our expenses to provide recreation or Lion Center activities are $608,600 on an annual basis. And here's why. We charge 50 cents for kids to swim at the pool in the summer. We charge a dollar for the adults. Do we want to charge more? Full cost recovery is probably a lot more than that, right? But that's what the tax is intended for, to supplement, to provide those services at a lower reduced cost to the residents, because that's a priority of the city. Pool rental fees are $40 an hour. I was told the average time is about three hours, about $120. Summer camp fees, $75 uh, for regular camp, five weeks, 25 days, that's $3 a day. And I think they said it was from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. So that's a heck of a deal for, for camp and supplies and a great activity for, for the children of the city. Uh, the mini camp, which is for the toddlers, was twice a week, 10 days, which equates to about $5 a day. So that's, that's what it, it does. So the tax, that's a good example of what the tax does. It provides these services at a reduced cost. It allows us to heat the pool year round and have lap swim, $20 a month. Um, you know, right now, and they are doing month to month just because of COVID and we don't know. But again, it still allows us to provide that reduced rate. Um, if I could just interrupt there just yes. to make a comment. I mean, it's just, it's great that you use those examples because I think sometimes people don't understand like how their funds are being used and utilized. And I, I, I think it's very clear when you're describing how, um, how much value is placed on these programs and how little is really collected. And so a lot of it subsidized. So I don't, I don't mean to interrupt your train of thought. I just thought it was an important point that you made. So and this is also to, to follow up on that, George. It's, uh, comments have been made about this utility tax being unfair uh, on the poor. But uh, and specifically attacked me on that, on that one issue. Uh, growing up as a poor kid on the east side of Brawley, I'll tell you what, many times the only access to the pool that I had was a Lion Center or a canal. Mm -hmm. So this is a direct benefit to the poor oh, youth oh, in the city of Brawley. 
um, and to Donnie, of course. No, you said canal. The Don. Yeah. yeah. No, I was just, I used to go swimming in the canals, and that's that was normal then, and still is for some, but very unsafe. And for the poor youth of the city, um, this is a great option for them, you know. And 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 obviously they, you know, we use it. Summer day camp. I mean, look at yeah. summer day camp. I mean, look at that. Just that program. I mean, not not everybody has a pool in their backyard, right? right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a great program and directly benefits the, those who have less in our city. Sorry to interrupt your train of thought. No, it's, it's okay. Please do so. Any questions or just comments, just kind of raise your hand and I'll stop. Don't worry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, scolded us right now. She's like, next time, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> So our other example that I have tonight is our police dispatch and graffiti abatement services. On the left, we have some grant funding and other revenue sources. Um, sometimes police does it, do issue tickets, um, but that revenue comes out to about $526,000 a year. But the cost to provide our public safety services is over $6 million a year. So again, a, an imbalance, but a priority, right? We don't, we can't, First of all, there's a lot of, um, I think, state caps on how much you could charge for certain fees. Um, but we don't want people issuing tickets to cover <laughs> costs, right? That's not, that's not how a city operates. But this is another great example of how the utility user tax supports the services that we provide the residents. So now let's get into some difficult conversations about what this, uh, what did this contingency plan detail. We'll talk a little bit more about the budget and the potential impacts of um, the UUT being removed from the city's uh, revenue source. So this is our general fund uh, expenditures for this current fiscal year. And we took this year because these are known costs that we have um, and if this were to go away today and we had to build a budget today based on our current numbers, um, this is what these look like. So public safety, police and fire are the largest portion of our budget. They're there on that pie chart on the left hand side. Uh, fire is 19% of the total budget and police is 35%. So collectively that's 54% or about $9.2 million for our public safety services. Um, so of course, keeping that in mind, if we have uh, cuts with this revenue source going away, we would have to cut some public safety services um, or decide to cut entire departments, eliminate them completely and not provide those services in order to um, keep whole our police and fire departments. But of course, some of those other departments like information technology may not be an option to remove, right? Everybody knows that everybody, all these departments rely on information technology. And so then you start to see how that puzzle gets, gets really, really complicated. I mean, if we um, were to lose information from technology, that would, that, that IT department, it would affect all the services that we provide, right? And every department. Everything. Well, and, and for the public's benefit, let's be clear, IT department is one person, one it's person. not 20 people. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, well, you yeah. know, Back to what is often emphasized. Look at the muscles on the yeah. over there. So, so many of these uh, departments, Carla, oh, yeah. that you're mentioning are um, pretty lean staff, um, including, I'm, I'm sure, your department. You know, there's always, you know, it would be nice to have more, right? We can, we, we can do more things, but uh, I think that's always a point to continue to emphasize um, how, how lean the operation's been operating. I think that's a really important point because we are, it's a lean organization. We're not heavy in any particular department. Yeah. We are lean. It's just, you know, this is the reality of the community we live in. We offer full services. And, you know, I know at least my time on council, there's always a demand for the public to use facilities, to use our parks, to, to expect a level of service, right? And so that's what's being provided at the time, you know? And so we've, I know we've had cutbacks throughout the years, but we're in a, position now where things are starting to change, improve, and, um, but the reality is, I mean, there was a reason why the tax was initiated to begin with, you know, and that's because this community, you know, requests certain, um, you know, uh, they request certain items uh, be presented within their community. So that's where we're at at this point, but we are lean. That's great. <coughs> 
So Armando's a one-man operation. I mean, that's <laughs> and I don't mean to pick on yeah. the different departments, but I want to give an example of hopefully of every one of them tonight, if I can, mm -hmm. uh, throughout our presentation. Sorry for not raising my hand. It's okay. <laughs> um, so this is just a different look at our current general fund expenses. So we took a look here as what can we, um, what could we potentially cut? Those items in gray are our costs that we cannot choose to not pay, right? There are pension obligations, our bond obligations, our workers' comp, other insurances such as auto, general liability, and that's 19%. All those three in gray, that's 19% of the total. So that leaves us with the blue portion, which is our operational expenditures, we're a little over $3 million, and then salary and benefits at $10.8 million. You might be alarmed and say, wow, that's a lot. But remember, we're a full service city. We provide those services in house. If we were a contract city, which is like a city I just came from, those operational expenses would be much larger because you would contract out police, you would contract out fire. And so the paradigm would just shift. But since the city of Raleigh has in house control and in house services, the salary and benefits um, are about 60, are 63% of the total expenditures. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting uh, uh, to point out here is if you look at the gray areas, though, as Carla said, we do not have any control over those expenses. That, if you add those three up, that's higher than our operational budget for the general fund, which goes to both uh, the old council's point about being lean. Uh, you think about that, and, and those costs will continue to increase. And again, we do not control those. So that is a huge, huge portion of the budget that's uh, out of our hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I do know the numbers that these are increasing next year as well, these gray um, amounts here. We know on average the workers' comp and insurances, they increase by 2 to 3%. So that represents about $48,000. The pension obligation bond will increase by $44,379. That debt service payment goes up slightly next year. And then the pension unfunded accrued liability payment will be going up by $256,207. So CalPERS just gave us those numbers in August, and uh, they were higher than we anticipated or what they projected last year. So um, collectively, we already know our costs next year are going up by $348,000. So remember at the beginning, I also talked about what the, that reduction target number was, right? And so what you have there on the right in red is that $2 million reduction. So what our target would be if we lost the utility user tax revenue is getting to a budget of about $15.2 million. So the next part is how do we do that? Okay. So always want to start with operational reductions, look at efficiencies, see where we can trim. Um, but of course, that has consequences in our case because we're pretty lean. Um, what we did was we eliminated many of the contributions and memberships across all city departments. Uh, all travel and training was eliminated. Uh, fuel was reduced because there would be less calls for service and less vehicles on the road because there would be less staff to be able to, to operate them. Our janitorial services were reduced because certain city facilities might be closed and uh, those services would not be required. And other line items, which hold at about $185,612, were reduced. And what those other line items are, it's, it's like employee recognition would go away. Uh, tools and equipment would be reduced. Operating supplies would be reduced. Uniforms would be reduced. And utility um, expenses would be reduced for electricity, natural gas, um, and, uh, and water because, again, some facilities would be closed. And so collectively, these operational reductions really only amounted to $368,000. So not a big part of that $2 million. And somebody might think, well, you don't really need training. You don't really need development. You don't really need memberships. What does that mean? Um, well, it really provides a lot of support for our staff. By a show of hands, I just want to know how many of you have served on like a board, a committee, given input, have been to a league conference, have 
really, you know, been part of these memberships like SCAG and, um, you know, we, we have so many, right? The league, we have mm -hmm. uh, government finance officers, uh, California Society of Municipal Finance Officers. I think the planning has one. Um, and so I know I am a current board member for the Southern California uh, Management Finance Association. And mm -hmm. to me, it provides tremendous value. I have resources. I have people that guide me. I have the ability to make a phone call or place an email and get something and saves me hours of time. And I know that that's the same for a lot of the staff that we have. And so not having those memberships and those connections um, would really impact our ability to keep up with current mandates and a turnaround um, time would just increase because we would kind of be on our own island uh, without those resources. So some people may not think they're important, but I can tell you personally, from personal experience, they are very, very important. And I know you have um, had also experience um, with a lot of those associations that provide great value to the city. Mm -hmm. So then we talked a little bit um, as the executive team, well, what else? You know, what else do we do? Um, so we talked about other reductions in operational expenditures. We talked about reducing our maintenance contracts within the information technology budget, reducing legal services, uh, reducing engineering um, professional services. Um, maybe our council meetings are recorded by staff, not by a professional recording um, you know, spectrum. Uh, reducing pest control services, and if we don't have a utility user tax, we don't need the consulting services or to you know recoup the revenue and, and monitor it. Um, the other one that could go away potentially is our sales tax consultant, but again, they audit, they monitor, and they provide us data um, that we can make. And so these decisions also would not be easy to make, right? Because what these services do is that they allow staff to make data-driven decisions. We talked about that on Thursday night, right? Data-driven decisions are really uh, what we need in order to have a solid future. They provide specialized services um, and support when it's needed. We don't have a city attorney on staff, and we cannot afford to have one on staff. And so our legal services are there when they're needed. And they provide great guidance along the way as all of these new mandates are, um, are brought upon us. So I'll pause if you have any comments on either one of these two, because we're going to show you the pie chart again, and then we're going to go into some personnel discussions. Yeah, so it's pretty, pretty telling and specific. Okay. So now we're at a total of seven hundred and forty-two thousand four hundred fifty-two dollars reduced. So here's our pie chart again. Same numbers, um, just with with that reduction, right? That we just talked about. So now our salary and benefits is a little bit bigger because we've made the blue portion our operational expenses smaller. We went from three million down to two point three million. Those same pension, workers' comp, liability payments, those are not going away. Those remain the same, but now they've become twenty one percent of our budget. Now our new target number for reduction is one point three million dollars. And uh, again, other than cutting services completely, that's, that's where salary and benefits come into play. So uh, I have a, two slides on personnel reduction, uh, elimination, or reclassifications that were, would be considered. We're talking about reducing our public safety officers by three to six full-time public safety officers. And the reason there's a range there is because, as we mentioned earlier, we have some cost for obligations that we can't eliminate that we know we're going to have on the horizon. And so depending on kind of where everything lands, that, that, that number may fluctuate. Uh, our reserve firefighter program would be eliminated completely. Our three full-time fire positions would be reclassified to a lower level because fire station two would be closed. And nearly all of the part-time positions would be eliminated as well as the temporary positions within these two um, departments. Um, I'd like to invite Chief York and Chief Duran because I am not a police officer or a firefighter and I'm not gonna pretend to be one. Um, and so I will pause and take a break and let them talk to you about what these mean for public safety um, and the impacts within their departments. Mm -hmm.
Once again, good evening, Mayor, Council, members of the public, Chief uh, Jimmy Duran. Well, this is, uh, you know, when, when I hear things like this, it's really heartbreaking because uh, I think we all love our city. And uh, it, just thinking about the tremendous impact that something like this could have in, 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 our, in our city, it's really, you know, heart-wrenching here. So as uh, some of you know, uh, we're already running lean. You know, our departments are very lean. I think we're doing a whole lot with what we have. I think the, for what I've seen here, all departments are very resourceful, including police and fire. Uh, but, I, but I am going to talk about the impact. You know, like I said, even just thinking about it makes me, you know, cringe on, on what could happen because this is what is a reality. Uh, something that we've been working hard was to uh, assign a school resource officer. You know, it took us months to get there. And now that we got there, you know, four weeks ago, now uh, potentially in the horizon, this, this could be no more. And, and, and it's really saddening. Uh, we're currently working with the uh, high school on, on a partnership. Uh, why? Because we want to create more opportunity for the youth. We're trying to create this youth program. And, of course, the SRO is, is, is pivotal here in, in this program. And when I think about it and the reduction, eliminating that SRO would make this program, you know, go away. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, today we had a meeting with the Broadly Union High. And, you know, we're getting excited about what we're going to do. But, unfortunately, you know, these are the kinds of things that would be eliminated. Uh, you know, we've been working on... <laughs> getting a volunteer services program going, uh, like a citizens on patrol, uh, you know, but we haven't, we're not there yet, but we're in process, unfortunately, you know, things like this cost money, fuel, you know, maybe uniforms, uh, unfortunately, that would have to be eliminated too, you know, it's, it's taking a lot of work to get here, but we will lose all that ground. Uh, one of the things that for me, uh, you know, our, our priorities out there with the people, you know, public safety and becoming uh, reactive instead of proactive it's just I don't know it's just not a good way of doing police work uh, and unfortunately we will be reactive which means uh, response times will most likely increase uh, as you know we've been doing a lot of efforts into uh, working with the transient community along with some nonprofits uh, and I think we, 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 we have moved forward I think if you drive on our main street you, you see we're not having those encampments like we used to have. And a lot of that has come with a lot of work and, and putting officers out there in the field to, 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 to talk to these individuals. And uh, again, all that would disappear overnight. Uh, we all know that it's uh, our illegal dumping program. I mean, our illegal dumping is a problem. We don't have a program yet, but we're working on it. You know? And again, all those efforts would be probably for nothing at that point. Uh, and as you know, if we don't do something, it just things just get worse. Our graffiti abatement, uh, I mean, we just have a full-time officer now or, or worker uh, doing it now. I mean, and I think we're, we've are we been seeing a lot of good things happen in our community because of that. You know, just the ability to liaison with nonprofits, clean up our town in different ways. And we all know, you know, that graffiti is a symptom of crime. It's, it's, it's just, it's like a, it's like an illness, you know, and then and, and unfortunately, uh, if we just, uh, it, some of these things go away. It's just not going to get us where we need to be, uh, you know. Uh, and as you all know, graffiti uh, just causes more problems. As we talked in the past, it just graffiti is used by individuals to target uh, certain neighborhoods, you know, to send messages, to send threats. And if that is allowed, it's definitely going to lead us to to more violence. And 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 unfortunately, being short staff already as it is, cutting even further, uh, dealing with that type of violence would definitely be be harder. Uh, in essence, all initiatives that we've been trying to work on, all these new things that we've been trying to implement will just come to a, to a halt. And some of these other things that, we, that are important for our community will definitely become secondary. For example, fireworks. I know it's important for our community. Definitely will become secondary. I mean, you know, we, this year we tried doing something for 4th of July, and, and I think we had a good impact. I mean, mm -hmm. and that was just a start. But unfortunately, uh, UET does not pass. I mean, we're going to have to cut back on that type of enforcement because it is not a priority for us for, or wouldn't be a priority for us. Catechol. I'm very excited that we're going to do catechol. Uh, and I think a lot of people in our community are, and everybody loves catechol. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we have to cut back on some of the services that we provide for such events. And these are important events to our, for our community mm -hmm. that bring revenue to our community, that brings a lot of things to our community. And we have to uh, cut back on, on, on our uh, involvement there. Um, 
we definitely have to be more selective with calls that we respond to. Uh, we have to get creative uh, in, in a way. I don't want to use the word triaging, but in essence, that's what it is. We have, probably have to triage some of these calls. Uh, we have to cut some services somewhere because we can't. We wouldn't be able to respond to everything. Uh, something as simple as a VIN verification, you know, we, that we can go to your house and check your VIN. Uh, now we probably have to defer it to some some other agency or maybe mm -hmm. even, uh, the highway patrol. I'm not sure mm -hmm. how we would do that. So we have to really think about how we're going to cut services. And we are thinking about it, but uh, I mean, at this point, we don't have definite answers. Uh, another example that I like to cite, uh, our initiative that we have started this year, you know, fighting narcotics via our task force uh, here in our city. I mean, it's uh, we are having an impact um, and I think we're seeing it and the level of violence that we had last year compared to this year, I think we're doing really good. You know, as an example, uh, this year we seized about 2,500 doses of fentanyl so far. Uh, I mean, before we were not doing that. Now we're making all these efforts. Uh, and you may think, well, 2,500 doses, was what's going on? What? Uh, unfortunately, we are living through an opioid epidemic, and fentanyl is an opioid. And, and I don't know if you've been following or have heard, throughout the last several months, we had quite a few overdoses, and some have re resulted in deaths. And uh, I, I like to believe that our efforts on removing these doses off the street, you know, definitely are helping our community. And uh, but it, but if we have to pull those resources back, uh, you know. These, there will be more doses out there being distributed in our community, and we all know how drugs affect our, our, our community. Uh, you know, it has been a lot of work to catch up uh, as far as our vacancies. You all know it's very hard to find qualified uh, officers. Uh, I, I think the, the, our community knows that, how hard it is to fill these vacancies, and we're getting there. We were hoping that by next week we're actually going to fill the last vacancy, uh, and that means money spent on recruiting and on processing. And that's, that could be very expensive for the city. And, and again, if we lose these positions, we definitely will lose not only money, but efforts and everything we've done to catch up to, you know, to where we need to be. And again, it's, and it's not like we're going above and beyond. It's just, it's just to keep the amount of officers that we have. And, and, and again, we are running lean. Uh, so our department's already running short staff, even if we have all these staffing levels uh, and the additional cuts that could be brought upon us by not passing the UUT uh, will definitely put us in a hard spot. And again, all the ground that what I believe we have covered, you know, uh, with a lot of work and dedication by all the officers and every staff member in the police department, I think would pretty much be crushed at, the, at this point. And so that's pretty much what I believe, that's my opinion of what would happen uh, to the police department and to the city. He always sets it up for me to fall. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, uh, City Council, and City staff. Mike York, Fire Chief. Um, I want to go over a few things that, um, that this contingency plan would mean for the fire department. And uh, I appreciate the, the word that is being used tonight, and, and Councilman Nava said is lean. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the Brawley Fire Department. Shortly before my employment here, the Brawley Fire Department had 27 full-time employees. There was three administrative staff. There was a fire chief, an assistant fire chief, and a fire marshal. Every day was eight full-time firefighters. And then there was a levy of varying numbers, but anywhere between 10 and 20 call paid firefighters who would respond to their pager call. Mm -hmm. Going farther back, they would respond to a large bell that was on the city, but that's a little too far. <laughs> so we've seen over the course of these last 20 years, my, my career, we've seen this de department lean down. Currently, we have 16 full-time firefighters, one administrative staff, which is myself, we have five reserve firefighters, and these are personnel that work a essentially a full-time shift, but they are not full-time employees. They don't have rights, benefits, et cetera. So a lot of cost savings there. Mm -hmm. And then we have, we're budgeted for 10 to 15. Right now I have four call paid firefighters uh, just due to lack of interest, basically. Mm -hmm. Should we have to implement the, the and so, Daily, we have seven firefighters. 
of various ranks. There's four out of station one and three out of station two. That's our daily operations staff. If the contingency plan was enacted, we would be down to five firefighters per day out of one station. So some numbers, and I hope I don't number everyone to death and bore them. The last time that the fire department was at five staff daily was in 2011, and we were averaging about 1,800 calls for service per year, 1,800 for five personnel. Currently, we're averaging 2,800 calls for service for seven personnel. We've added 1,000 calls to our annual volume. We've added two personnel. Those numbers don't exactly line up. What is not going to happen is our calls for service are not going to decrease. Mm -hmm. I, think that's a, I think that's a given. We're going to see at least a maintenance and more than likely an increase as we've seen over the last several years. So just as we had in the 90s where we had 1,600 calls for service, but we had eight people a day, what's changed? Well, we've leaned down. We are expecting more from less personnel. We all know that that's completely impossible to totally offset. So we've seen a reduction in services. For instance, every year, the Raleigh Fire Department used to test and maintain every single fire hydrant in this city. That program has not existed for the last 10 years. We don't have the time, we don't have the personnel. Now, some of the maintenance and some of the testing has been assumed by the Public Works Department, but not all of it. And I can see, don't wanna speak for another department, but if we're enacting this contingency plan, everyone's gonna be short-staffed and that program will be eliminated completely. Other things that we're looking at, just in terms of what our everyday daily staff used to do and is now doing more of our inspections, public education. And the most important thing is training. We strive very hard to maintain our training, which is recommended by the National Fire Protection Association as two hours per day. It's very difficult to maintain that. We've, we very rarely succeed in meeting our two hours per day goal. If we're dropping down, it's gonna be even more difficult. Now, in the fire service, we have something called HAVs, which are high acuity, low frequency events. We love our acronyms. So we can run medical aids all the time. Because we run them all the time, we don't have to train very much on them. We do them in practice. We don't, thankfully, have very many fires, structure fires. We're very good at fighting them, but we're very good because we train at them. If we're unable to maintain our training schedule because of a reduction in staff, what we're gonna see is an increase in injuries. We're gonna see a decrease in our effectiveness on scene. So that's kind of what this all means when we're looking at what we're look at the at the reductions that are being proposed in the contingency plan. The closure of station two. Station two was campaigned, as many of you know, for decades to get open. And it was a struggle and it required grant funding and et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, it's a very much needed facility, but we have to have people in it to staff it. And this won't, this staffing model won't support two stations. Closing station two means that we will have increased response times to that area of the city, meaning the east side, on a normal basis. And then one of the major concerns for opening the station was that our train track, a very busy train track, causes very frequent delays getting across from station one, which is on the west side of the tracks, to anything on the east side. The closure of station two will also impose some unique challenges in that station one is so old that not all of our equipment is going to fit in it physically, as in our ladder truck has no means of fitting anywhere in station one. We have an outbuilding that's not conducive to rapid response. Station two was built upon newer specifications, taller vehicles, et cetera. Excuse me. There's one other issue that comes up when I spoke about the call volumes. Um, so today, about three o'clock, we had a brush fire along our river bottom. I still have units out. In the time between it responded to right now, we've had three additional calls for service. Now, my station one personnel 
are completely devoted to this fire, and my Station 2 personnel have been able to handle those three calls. This is not an unheard of occurrence. As a matter of fact, statistically over the last five years, what we call, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my, my, uh, my, my notes will not open, obviously. <laughs> I, need, I need Armando to help me out, sorry. <laughs> um, so our overlapping incident counts. We average 28% over the last five years. So almost a third of our calls for service have an overlap. Mm -hmm. Last year it was 800 calls. So when we're looking at reducing the number of personnel that's available daily, we're looking at closing a station, just bare bones, we're looking at being unable or being very seriously delayed to responding to up to 800 calls for service. And this is something that, I'll use that word that Chief Duran used, makes me cringe, it makes me worried, it makes my heart sick. Um, Chief, Chief York, if I could just interrupt. Sure. Just for the public's benefit and so they understand, and so we understand and everybody here understands, those calls for service, could you just give a description of the types of calls, please? Absolutely. So we are what's considered an all hazards department, even though we still wear the moniker of fire department. We respond to all manners of fires. We respond to all manners of medical aids. Uh, we respond to any 911 call for medical aid whatsoever, and I will be speaking more on that in just a second. We respond to rescues, uh, so people trapped in equipment, people trapped in vehicles, people um, unable to ambulate themselves is basic definition of rescue. We respond to hazardous materials incidents. We respond to calls for service, which can be anything from lift assist for people that have fallen. They don't need anything but help up. We respond to um, people and animals locked in vehicles. Um, pretty much, if you don't need a police officer and you call 911, you're getting us. And many times when you do call for a police officer, you're also getting us. <laughs> so Thank you for that. No, it's a perfect segue. So what does that mean if we enact the contingency plan? The simple fact is we won't be able to respond to 2,800 calls per year with the staffing that we have. We're going to be late to many of them or we're not gonna be able to get to them in time for us to have any effect whatsoever. So we're gonna to have to triage our calls. Now, it's not unheard of in many jurisdictions for fire departments to triage calls for service, specifically medical calls. To fully enact that though would require a dispatch dispatchers to be trained in what's called EMD or emergency medical dispatch. This is an additional <laughs> staffing problem. That's an additional um, budgetary item in our dispatch, which is under Jimmy's wheelhouse. And it's something that we hope to do. We had many meetings with our dispatchers recently and EMD is a very constantly brought up thing, but it's increasing what we need, not a reduction. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's been identified, we did it for a brief period of time during COVID um, is that we may have to triage locations, which is something that we wouldn't need EMD. So basically any facility with trained medical staff, we may have to disregard 911 calls to them. That's, now if it's the hospital, which they do call 911 for us, that's probably not that big of a deal. If it's your local doctor's clinic, they may not have everything for a true emergency and we do respond to those quite frequently. And those would be what we're looking at, is we're gonna be looking at what can we cut away, essentially. And then I don't wanna take up too much more time. Those are, those are already, those, those facts are already, um, you know, speak for themselves. Um, but what we will be looking at, other than those major stuff, just, just to kind of go down through it, is we'll have an increased use of our mutual response, or our mutual aid system where we request aid from all of our other cities. Now that's a voluntary program essentially. And there is the idea of reciprocity, even as we would be asking our sister agencies, who many are facing similar issues that we are, to please come and help us. We would also be saying over the radio, we can't go to help you. Or if we do, we're gonna be leaving our city uncovered, which we cannot do. Um, we're gonna be looking at issues of personnel retention due to burnout, due to increased event, uh, injury, just to increase workload. Um, there's very well documented um, 
associated increases of injury risk whenever you redu reduce staff. We'll have a basic decrease in effectiveness, even the calls that we do manage to get to, which we will get to a majority of. I don't want to try to scare people. We will get to a majority of the calls, but we'll be decreased effectiveness. As a matter of fact, on the incident right now, I have five firefighters. I'm still man managed to have three to respond to the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of our ancillary functions. So like I mentioned, hydrant testing, public events, education, life safety, fire safety, fire inspections, flow test studies for new developments, uh, plan check and plan review for fire sprinkler and fire prevention systems. All of these are going to be in seriously delayed or will we'll be unable to, to facilitate. Chief, is there any, there's kind of a secondary, but um, I believe our transport agency is co-located at our station, so a station closure would potentially displace that resource as well, right? Uh, yes, so um, currently AMR contracts for facilities at both stations to house two ambulances. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not had any real communication with them, but if we close station two, we'll be looking at either having to co-locate within station one, and if we can manage that, or we would, or they would have to find different um, housing, which would be another reduction in revenues. Because it could be displacing both, right? Because you're going to consolidate into one potentially, so it could get... There is that potential as yeah. station one is an older facility with limited, um, limited sl uh, sleeping quarters and limited other facilities, bathrooms, restrooms, et cetera. Um, that is something that has to be explored more fully. Yeah, so there's, there's definitely a ripple effect, the bottom line. We we're just talking about the core primary, but even beyond that, that's what um, I think members of the public need to understand is and how intertwined all these services are, especially we're not just talking public ser um, safety, but it's all interconnected, even to our hospital, right, their, their capabilities. And, and quite frankly, I, I, Tyler brought up at the beginning, um, the, the, the meeting that we had for this preface, this was over five hours long. Mm -hmm. I'm sure just, just on ramifications of fire service, I could bore everybody to death and speak till midnight. And I'm sure all my fellow department heads could as well. We're focusing on the major issues, but you're very much correct. There's a lot of ripple effect. And a lot of those others, they, they will have a snowball effect in addition because there will be reduced revenues, especially when it comes to plan check and inspections. Yeah. Chief, uh, back to the medical calls. When, when I was on the fire department, I think we probably had 80 to 90% of our calls were medical calls as opposed to fires or traffic collisions. Do you know about what the percentage of your calls are medical calls? Um, over about a five-year average, we'll call it 85%. It fluctuates 3 to 4% per year. Oh. And so uh, 800 of those probably. Figure about 700 yeah. are calls for medical will be late or or not not be able to answer. AMR will get there first or whatever. Yes, and um, again, these are these are issues that are cross county, but yeah, we AMR already has a slower response than us typically. This isn't bad mouthing, it's just a nature of the game on how far they have to right. travel in their locations. We're dedicated to the city of Brawley. We, we don't leave except for some extenuating circumstances. We're first out the gate, we get on scene first, and we start providing that definitive care. Well, and the AMR is also handling the inter-facility transport from our hospitals, yes. too. So, yeah, they're, they're serving the community in a couple different ways. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions mm -hmm. or comments for either chief? No. no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not, Thank you. Not good news. And we didn't thank Chief uh, Duran earlier, but, yeah. you know, obviously it's one of those moments where we're not obviously, you know, thrilled about the information. I don't think anybody would be, so. I did want to say uh, a lot of the items that Chief Duran brought up are are in process. They're, they're plans and goals that he has set as, as a chief here to uh, increase efficiency within his department and yeah. increase uh, morale among the, the personnel there and, and even, you know, reaching out to the community. And so many of these, um, so many of these cuts that will have to be made are outward facing services. And um, so we don't trot out, you know, <laughs> police and fire and other departments just to, to scare people, but these are real cuts in service that, that will have an effect on livability of our community and quality of life. There's Not more? as tall as Chief York. There's a little bit more, yes, unfortunately. Um, 
So those personnel reductions would not be enough, right? We did talk about how public safety was 54% of the general fund budget, but we do have other services. And unfortunately, this, um, these reductions would also trickle into those programs. Um, we have, um, we have just some options here as well that we're presenting. Uh, four management positions would either be eliminated or reclassified to lower positions. Um, and these are amongst all those other departments. Um, so there's eight full-time um, positions within the parks uh, department uh, or program and service related departments such as recreation, lion center, library type of positions uh, that would be reduced, um, eliminated uh, if the tax did not pass. And then all of the part-time or nearly all the part-time and temporary positions within all of those services would also need to be eliminated. So that's like the lifeguards or um, summer day camp workers, um, maybe some part-time other staff within the other services. And so again, if that happens, we have to remove services altogether, right? Reduce them. Um, overtime would increase for those employees that are left behind performing uh, the duties um, of these positions because oftentimes some of these departments, the work just shifts, it doesn't go away. Um, we would have a difficult time recruiting. And even our increased response times for finance and other departments would change. Maybe our lines are a little bit longer out the door um, if we don't have enough personnel to assist or pick up the phones. And we're talking about all the departments, public works, community de um, development, just a lot of impact because everybody would be required to do more. Um, we also would maybe have um, an increased time to review uh, projects, as just, uh, Chief York just mentioned, and an, an in decreased ability to apply for grants, um, and grants equate to capital improvement project reductions and infrastructure project reductions. So again, there is this trickle effect um, amongst all of the departments, and we really do rely on one another. Uh, to get everything done because we are a full service city. So when we're talking about these other reductions in these other departments, these departments on the screen are the potential departments that would be reduced or completely eliminated um, uh, from city services. So we're talking about graffiti abatement, recreational programs, the Lion Center pool, library, senior center, the administration building, which is the building we're currently in, um, the uh, building inspections, code enforcement, animal control, the splash pad, uh, park restrooms uh, were closed during COVID. Maybe that happens again. They're not open to the public. Uh, park maintenance would be reduced. The finance department would be reduced. Utility billing would be impacted and reduced. And uh, literacy programs that are administered to the library may also be reduced or eliminated. So these are real lives. Um, real programs, real benefits for our community. Um, I know it's difficult. I know staff is listening. And um, as I told you earlier today, this is one of the most difficult presentations because I know that these consequences are, are real for with real people behind them and real services for the community. Absolutely. I've mentioned that in the past and I'm glad that you mentioned it. And I'm glad that you said, you know, staff is listening, but the public's listening as well. And I do want to let the public know that these are, you know, they're, they're real people. Mm -hmm. that are behind the positions. It's not just a position on a piece of paper. These are people, these are families, these are households. These are people that work for our benefit, for the benefit of the community. And these are services that are offered. So I'm glad that you mentioned that there's human beings behind all of this. It's not just a position. It's not just a title on a screen. You know, it's, it, they're actual services provided by human beings that have families, that have responsibilities. So thank you for saying that. So one more slide before we kind of end these, these reduction talks. Um, certainly all of these impacts, um, both Chief York and um, Chief Duran mentioned some of these other consequences, right, where unemployment claims and costs would increase uh, because we would have these layoffs. We would have overall lowered employee morale. Um, additional staff may decide to leave, and we'll have additional staff turnover in departments and a really difficult time recruiting under those conditions. Um, we would certainly have to reopen our labor negotiations that we just completed. We have three-year agreements with a clause to reopen. Um, should you know revenues reduce by a certain amount, and so we would have to undertake those efforts again. 
um, we, again, as mentioned earlier, might have to implement full cost recovery in order to offer any of those city programs or some of those city programs. So um, remember the pool cost 50 cents, maybe it costs $5, maybe it costs $10, but are people going to use it at that cost? And so um, a full cost recovery would be extremely difficult to implement. Um, we would, uh, Chief York mentioned this about uh, not having the ability to volunteer and help our neighboring agencies. We get a lot of um, satisfaction as city staff being able to collaborate with these agencies and learn from them and um, together as a county provide additional services to our residents. Um, and we wouldn't be able to host or attend events uh, when we're requested. Those may be far and few in between um, and when we're able to. And certainly one that I didn't put up here, but I know will happen is all of our um, salary employees will end up working more to cover for some of these because it doesn't matter if we work 90 hours or 80 hours every two weeks, uh, we're paid the same and we would still have to provide some of these services. And so there'd be pressure on all of these salary employees as well to do more, more, more. And I think um, you're mentioning something uh, that's very important when it has to do with personnel and retention and you know and turnover. Could you imagine what it'd be like to sit here in a position working for the city and know that every three years we got to go through this process or every five years and not knowing if you're going to have a job? Um, and I think that's a very scary situation. And, you know, how many people are going to want to stick around or actually want to come work for the city? Um, so that's key. I think it's key that we do with this. Uh... Anyways, thank you. Thank you for that. Just uh, my mind is starting to wander of all the impacts, uh, the negative impacts of the city of this, wasn't, this measure wouldn't pass. So I did want to pause and just kind of ask if there's, if there's any other questions regarding the potential reductions because I've got about three more slides, but really we're going to end with a talk about um, giving voice to the employees, some of the comments that they have provided to me, um, and then also talk about uh, the current city momentum that we have a little bit more and how that would be impacted and uh, what our road to recovery would look like if the tax measure didn't pass. Before I do that, I just want to pause here. Okay. So what are our employees saying? So these are some of the comments that have been given to me over the last several months as these discussions have evolved. Um, some of them include, you know, we're burnt out with limited staffing levels. We can't keep trying to do more with less. Uh, departments help one another to get the job done. We rely upon one another. We're proud to serve the city of Brawley. My children go to school here, play sports in Brawley. And um, Captain Eloy is on a, a fire call that Chief um, mentioned earlier, but he wanted to come up and say a few words, and he uh, can't be here, but he asked me if I could please read something. So I'm going to pretend that I am Eloy Martinez, <laughs> um, and, and so it'll, it'll sound weird because it says my name is Eloy, but I'm not Eloy. But um, these are his words, and he just wanted to kind of uh, bring it home to what it means for, for him as a long-term city employee. So he wrote, uh, my name is Eloy Mar Martinez, and I am a captain with the City Fire Department, City of Brawley Fire Department. I have been a City of Brawley employee since I was 19. I grew up in the city, I live here, and my kids go to school here. I am here today to share services the fire department provides and how cutting the department's budget, if the utility user tax doesn't pass, would impact our ability to provide these services. We are a young, eager department who relies on internal mentoring and training. We are a 24-hour, seven days a week operation. We are ready to respond every holiday, every weekend, and late night. We are already doing more and more with the same resources. Our staff is nearly burnt out, both mentally and physically at times. Reducing operational expenses for the fire department means we are not able to stock necessary supplies and life-saving equipment may not be replaced or upgraded as often as needed or at all. Losing fire staff means we are responding to calls with less resources. Fires would take longer to put out. We may not be able to respond to all of the calls and the city would have an increased need of mutual aid resources. Fire also relies often on the collaboration with other city personnel during and after an incident. For example, a large fire leaves smoldering ashes 
that requires a backhoe or other heavy equipment to fully extinguish the flames. Public Works provides assistance so fire personnel is able to answer another call for service. During violent medical calls, fire will often uh, rely upon law enforcement officers to assist with monitoring a victim while life-saving medical aid is provided. Sometimes these patients also have weapons, very large weapons, I've seen pictures, that can be used to hurt the staff. And again, law enforcement is able to assist in these instances. But if other departments also have less resources, outdated equipment, or are short-staffed, this internal mutual aid we often rely on to effectively do our jobs will deteriorate, leading to unnecessary increased risks on calls. As a department, we also enjoy the ability to attend community events, career development days, and provide fire prevention and education to the public. The kids enjoy seeing the big red fire truck, and we also enjoy interacting and teaching them about fire prevention. With less staff, we would not be able to attend these events, which reduces our ability to recruit new staff, leave lasting impressions, and provide life-saving education. I have worked my way up in the fire, in the fire um, department, starting in the fire reserve program, became a firefighter, then a lieutenant, and now a captain, all within the city of Brawley Fire Department. I want others to have the same opportunities I have had. I want the fire department to do more, not less, for the community, my family, many city uh, colleagues, and I call home. So, you know, when I read those words and, and I have employees telling me these things, I think that's why this presentation, just as it evolved, became even harder and harder mm -hmm. for me to, um, to put together. So if we can shift a little bit about um, the current momentum that the city has. I was looking through our Facebook post, and Andrea's done a great job. It took me a long time to kind of go through all of them, and I pulled some of them. And these are some of the things that we've been able to do. If you recall, in the spring of 2020, COVID hit, and it turned all of our worlds upside down. Many of our facilities were closed. It reshaped our ability to provide services. They were very, very limited, if provided at all. Um, and in 2021, we have begun to gradually recover, recover back to normal. The city would lose this momentum and return to near pre-pandemic level services if the utility user tax expires. So that is, that's a real, something we already went through recently, right? And so imagine that again. Imagine pulling back and not having all of these things that are on your screen, um, DJs in the park, library programs, um, the IID support to reopen the pool and provide swim for the public, um, events for the community, you know, a, a decreased catacall support. Um, these are real, real impacts um, and great momentum that we have. I and mean, we don't want to lose that momentum that we are currently striving for and working really, really hard, not just in police and fire, but you see here all the departments of the city um, really want to serve the community. They want to provide more programs. They don't want to provide less. Do you want to say? Not yet. <laughs> but we have to be realistic. Um, especially myself as your finance director. Um, if the tax does not pass, we're going to have a difficult road to recovery. It's going to be hard, um, but we're going to have to do it, right? Um, the impacts would be real. They would start quickly, which is why um, they were quantified. Doesn't mean they will happen overnight, but it's kind of like you're dimming the switch. Um, we talked a lot about there being mutual agreements and stuff we'd have to work out and grants we'd have to unwind, so that would take some time. Um, we would have to evaluate additional efficiencies or outsourcing of uh, services to see if that is more beneficial um, should the city uh, continue to want to provide some of the services. Uh, we might even want to consider creating a finance committee of residents and maybe even a council member uh, in order to evaluate other revenue opportunities that the voters might, uh, might support. Uh, we can have a transaction and use sales tax that we mentioned earlier the city doesn't have. We could consider a cannabis tax. We could consider um, a hotel tax increase. Uh, or a business license fee increase. Yes, council member. Kathy. And I think, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think this is a great opportunity to bring this up, is cannabis tax. 
uh, and perhaps now would be a good time to bring, uh, create an exploratory committee to create an ordinance to allow for the sale of cannabis in our city. Other uh, cities in the community have uh, capitalized on this, and I think we have a great opportunity with the bypass now to create a zone specifically uh, for the sale of cannabis so that we can capitalize on that sales tax. It is state law. It is legal to do. And I know that we have resisted as a city uh, to bring that industry in here, but it is the law. It is something that folks are legally allowed to do. And some of the population might not want it, but it's a necessity. And other folks are capitalizing on this. I think that now would be the time to create an exploratory committee to create an ordinance to bring in uh, cannabis into the city of Broadway so that we can begin to take advantage of the tax and the revenue that has that will come in and has already benefited the uh, city of Imperial and the city of Calexico. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, and certainly all of these would require voter approval. And so, again, remember, it's not overnight. Um, the revenue would, would start to decrease after May, and so between now and May, we'd have to make a lot of these difficult decisions, and any one of these tax measures wouldn't be on the, um, the earliest would be on the November 2022 ballot with a future implementation date. A lot of new taxes have at least a 90-day implementation date after an ordinance is approved, mm -hmm. um, and so again, that means it, that wouldn't take effect maybe until April of 2023. That's a long time, and that's a real time frame. Um, and between now and then, like let's say we explore cannabis, um, that's a lot. I'm, I'm not an expert in cannabis, but that would require um, consultants, our city attorney, um, a lot of public communication. Very, very doable, but it'd have to be an intentional thing that we're focused on and that the, we know that the community would potentially support in order to get us prepared to put together resolutions for a ballot measure. Remember, we did our resolutions for the utility user tax in June for a November election, which mm -hmm. means that gives us very little time between now and let's say April to get all of that compiled together. So um, if not, then we'd have to wait till November of 2024 or have a special election again in November of 2023. So again, this is the city it can't just create revenue. I, I wish we could, I wish it wasn't that difficult. And I wish I didn't have to deliver such news, um, but that's the reality of the world that we live in. Um, we talked about the full cost recovery of services and um, having to implement that. That would be a little bit quicker. Um, we would do a full cost recovery analysis and you could implement those fees and they could go into effect as probably early as May or June. Um, and so that, that would be a quicker turnaround time. Um, but again, still require some consultant third party services to do the analysis. Um, the other option is to temporarily use some reserves. We don't have a, a lot of reserves, but we would use some or could use some to postpone further reductions um, until some of these decisions are made. Um, and that really concludes my presentation. I did want to let the public and staff know that the presentation is online. Um, it is under the utility user tax um, ballot measure tab. It's about the third item down. Um, just as it was presented here tonight, I am working on having it translated to Spanish. Um, I do speak Spanish, so if anybody wants to um, speak about the, the ballot or has questions, and, and I'm happy to, to meet with them and speak to them in Spanish as well. Thank you. When, uh, thank you, Carla. Uh, I have a comment to make. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to, uh, and this is more for the public that's listening than for council and staff. Uh, at the end of the day, it was a very, very painful process that was collaborated with uh, all the department heads, but ultimately these are, these are recommendations made that were very tough by, by me, the city manager, but they're just that, they're recommendations. Um, it is a net zero sum game. So if some things are changed, they'll have to be uh, the recommendations. We'll have to cut something else over adding back. So, but again, I just want to stress these are recommendations prepared uh, by staff and myself. And uh, that is all. And thank you very much for that painful presentation. Uh, I know it was a lot of effort on uh, everybody, and especially Carla for presenting this. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a comment to make. Sure. Um, so uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for everybody um, for paying attention, listening, and presenting. Um, I think sometimes the public 
views, I've gone through this exercise before when the tax is up for renewal. I think sometimes the public thinks that it's, it's just really an exercise um, by the city council and there's like scare tactics behind it, like, oh, this is going to really destroy the city. But this is a reality that we're faced with. I mean, there's a reason why um, many years ago that this tax was um, enacted by the public. They understood the need for it. And uh, we've gone through various cycles of renewing the tax, but it's just a necessary part of running this community. You know, we run lean. It's been expressed here. And I think it's, it's for many people that aren't engaged within the city, and there's many, 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 you know, that, you know, the city functions, they don't really engage themselves within city government and how it operates. But I can, I can speak for my behalf and the people that listen to me, and I, I hope um, it's just clear that this city does run lean. You know, we're not, uh, we're not top heavy. We don't have um, so many people employed here that we can easily function without them. You know, it, it's just a community that runs lean, but, you know, I always say this, the city of Brawley is not poor, but we're certainly not rich, you know, and we're running as effectively as we can um, with, with the limitations that we have. So we, I hope that the public um, understands that this tax is an important, uh, it, it's an important element of how we function within the city. And I think as we, it was expressed here very well by you, in the presentation and how it subsidizes many of the services that are provided to the city. And I, I certainly would hope that the public doesn't think that what's expressed here are scare tactics, because they're not. It's just the reality of the circumstances we have. And so, um, and there are real people that operate within the city. You know, these are lives that are dependent on employment and they live here within our community and they raise families here and they participate just like everybody else. So, and they're also users of city services, right? They're just living their lives here. So anyway, I just wanted to express that and, you know, Council I think- Council Member no, you just brought it, just while the thought popped in my head, you know how it is, it'll disappear sure. if I don't jump <laughs> Go on jump it. But it, it, it really, you know, as you, as you just mentioned that, I, I think, um, I, and we've gone through this in the past as well, but, if, if there's, for those that are not going to support it, don't do your thing. I mean, it, it just, it's laying out the facts. And you just said that. It's not meant to be a scare tactic. Um, um, our, our finance director very descriptively laid out the case. So, um, you know, as those decisions are being made, I think it's very clear. It, it, we, we move in that direction. Um, that's just going to be the future reality, and we're all going to rally around it and do our best. But the fact is, those are the facts. And I think that's important. These are not opinions that was presented. They were not slides of just, you know, uh, you know numbers that were made up. We just went through a budget um, cycle with our new finance director. And we're very proud of the fact that coming out of COVID, that we're able to move forward with um, a balanced budget where, you know, revenues and expenditures matched. Um, I challenge a lot of cities of our size to do that coming out of COVID without meticulous planning. Um, that really was set in motion many years ago, um, well, at least the recent, you know, several years. And um, so I think the combination of our staff and everything they're doing to add with the lean that, that um, Councilmember Nava is talking about is really what our entire staff does to deliver year in and year out, um, I think a fiscally conservative do, do as much as we can as a full service city. Maybe the airport doesn't matter to some people and maybe it doesn't have something to do with the general fund um, per se, but you can see the domino effect. It's all connected. Our ability to you know, monitor, to manage, to, to, to provide all this. So it really affects all of our departments. This is not just a general fund discussion. It really is a quality of life issue. So that, 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 that's really what's you know, kind, of, kind of before us. And I think it's important that, uh, um, that you know, the public understands these are just simply the facts. And uh, we want to make sure that's provided. But the pr presentation that was given a little bit earlier under public um, presentation with, you know, Los Lagos, some of the, we can go down the laundry list of some very exciting things that are coming, that are already happening. And, and some of that was outlined earlier today. Um, and it, it would be a shame, again, that if we lose some um, efficacy in our ability to deliver um, as a city, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a role we play, a very active role we play 
So again, we're not even talking about some of those downstream you know, effects. I think it's very important that um, we had a swearing in ceremony today, you know, <laughs> with cheap, you know, getting to the staffing levels at PD, the public was loud about how important public safety is to them. So I think having both our chiefs here to speak to that is what the public wants. They've been very clear on that, at least since I've been on council, that that is very important. So um, I think it was, you know, again, well done. Very informative for me, and I'm here in all the meetings and know uh, quite a bit, but you always learn quite a bit more. So um, Carla, I appreciate that um, presentation and both chiefs um, for stepping up and sharing the details and the impacts. Um, yeah, if I may jump in now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, Carla, I really appreciate the report and uh, uh, Tyler, the the work that you guys have done to put this, uh, you know, this emergency budget, I guess, uh, uh, it's another way to look at it. Um, and, you know, it just, I wasn't looking forward to this, to this meeting, to be honest with you, just to see every, any time, and those who know my background know how, uh, what an advocate I've been for workers uh, for many, many years and how much I care about every single one of the employees here in the city. Um, and to consider even cutting any one single uh, position is it's, it's heartbreaking. But I look at the greater picture, the greater picture of everything, everyone else that would be affected. Uh, this is constant criticism of us taxing the poor. Uh, this is a tax that's based on consumption, right? And so those who consume more of all these services will obviously pay more. And those are the ones that could afford it and those that can will pay less. But I think these services will greatly affect, or the cuts will greatly affect the services that we can provide to the overall population in the city of Brawley, including uh, those poor, and specifically the poor, the youth that are already underserved, in my opinion. Um, it would hurt them, impact them even, even in a greater manner. But even uh, when you look at that, uh, many years ago, we, uh, my previous employer, we, we commissioned a study from the University of Colorado of what it would take to create jobs in Imperial County. And just based on what we produce here, uh, we know that in the state for every job at the time, that was every job that was created, it would create more, uh, four more. In San Diego County, it was one for one. And in Imperial County, we had to create four employments or four jobs just to create for it to naturally uh, create one more as a result. Um, and when we start eliminating positions here, it has a greater effect. All this disposable income that's now gone, all these positions that are gone, and the folks that are, can no longer be here and can't work here. It's not just gonna be the city employees that are gonna lose, uh, some of them that are gonna lose their jobs, and it's gonna be many, many, many others, including those that rely on, you know, this, where the city buys products and whatnot. Um, so this is going to have, a, if it does not pass, I think it would have a much greater impact on the old community as a whole and not just the city of Brawley. So I, I hope that this is the last time we are discussing this. Um, and I hope that everything goes well and that the voters, um, and that this does not expire. Um, that's all I have to say. And thank you so much for all your hard work, Carla. You did a great job. Mr. I'd like to. Mr. Just a few statements. Um, I've been here in Brawley for 68 years. My family's been here almost 100, I guess. And I, I don't fool myself in thinking that Brawley won't continue as a city, and it will exist as a city, and it always has, and it's, it's home to me. Um, I would say that without this tax, um, the city of Brawley will look much differently. I think the facts speak for themselves. I don't think there's any debate there. It, 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 the services would be, would be cut dramatically, and I believe that the city would suffer as a result of that. Um, I pride myself here in sitting here for the last 12 years as a council member that, that I don't ask the citizens of Brawley to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. And, and it, as regards this tax, certainly uh, I'm not over over enthusiastic about taxes under any circumstances but as far as this tax goes it is a tax that directly benefits the city it stays in the city um, I pay it just as everyone else does and maybe I pay more than some of the people here in the city but I do understand the value of it and I understand what what it means for the city of Brawley and being a lifelong resident of the city of Brawley I certainly see it every day I've been here through Brawley through hard times and bad times and great times. And, and I think that we, we still continue to move forward and try to make this city the best place that we can make it. And I think that this, this tax is a part of that. 
and it may only be a portion of that, but I think it's very, very important for the city. And my whole thing behind that is I don't ask anybody to vote on anything that I wouldn't vote on myself, and I'll leave it with that for the, for the citizens of the city. I think we want the services. I think it impacts everybody. It impacts the poor. It impacts low-income people. It impacts people that have a lot of money. But I think ultimately it benefits everyone in the city to have sufficient revenue and to continue the services that we that we provide as a full service city. I don't want to subcontract out things. I never have been real strongly in favor of that. But if push comes to shove and those are the hard decisions that we have to make, then we'll make those. But I would hope everyone at least really seriously considers this issue. Um, I know which way I'm going to be voting, and I hope everyone l looks to their conscience I to which way they would like to see this city proceed. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for your comments. Um, we appreciate the presentation, and uh, I hope that the viewership online was good tonight. And, uh, oh, Daniel, did you have a comment? Yeah. If I may, real quick. Sure. Our mm -hmm. mayor, council, staff. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I just, uh, and, and I don't have notes, so it's going to be really brief. Um, one thing uh, that came, we came across is that people have their sentiment with uh, the hard times right now, that taxes. Tax is always a hard word. And um, I'm trying to uh, uh, explain it to the public, and this is more to the public, obviously. Uh, a comment that I wanted uh, to share is this is a, we have to handle this as a GoFundMe uh, account for the city because uh, there are voices that, um, come up uh, some, somewhat to the sentiment of, uh, well, I, I punish them, or I want to show them, or they, uh, enough is enough, or whatnot. Um, but actually, they're hurting themselves. And this is the thing that the mm -hmm. public needs to understand, that this is something that uh, we as a community you know, have the opportunity to uh, fund our own city. And literally, uh, just if we break it down, uh, to a household that's just like somewhere in the ballpark of 20 bucks a month. So uh, I think uh, the public can understand, and uh, I hope they soften their hearts to this uh, moment that we so desperately need this, these services. So that's all I just wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's been said in times past when this has come up uh, for a vote that <clears throat> there's always increased costs of doing business and whether you're a municipality or a private business the costs go up each year um, to provide the services that you provide um, I was looking at that the pie chart and uh, those areas in gray that we don't have a choice that we have to pay those whether it's workers comp or or pension liability um, that any two of those together look like uh, would amount to what the utility user tax brings in. These are things that we don't have a choice that we have to pay. And, and constantly you see um, legislation handed down from the state and from the federal level that affect us at a local level that we don't really have the money to, to cover those costs. But, but with a lot of uh, one size fits all legislation, we get hit the same as, as a larger city would. And, and so as Detective Schleyer pointed out, um, you know, we have to figure out how to make ends meet one way or another. And so I appreciate your comment, you know, that this is kind of something that community members can do to give back and, and help themselves um, until such a time as, as uh, Tom DuBose mentioned tonight, where perhaps revenues will increase in other ways through industry, through sales tax increases and that kind of stuff. Um, until such a time as that occurs, these are our stopgap measures that have, that have been ongoing for three decades now. Our hope is that, um, that the outlook will improve for the city of Brawley and for the, the county in general. And if some of these industries do take off um, the way they're projected to, I think th that we will see better days financially. Of course, there will be other legislation that's handed down that will you know, kind of uh, cut our feet out from underneath us. But um, I, we do hope and pray that better days are ahead um, but we also do hope and pray that this, um, this measure will pass this time around again. And it's been mentioned that um, if, 
if uh, there comes a day when it's not needed, these extra $2 million or so are brought in in other ways that don't uh, affect the general public like this utility user tax does, there is an opportunity um, to bring it back, uh, to vote it out, um, and not have to pay it anymore. But uh, our hope is, as a council and as, as, a, as a city, that the community members will vote uh, in the majority to approve this this utility user tax. So thank you for the presentation, all of you. And we'll wrap that up and move on to item seven, which is our regular business. Thank you for your patience, those of you that are on the agenda. We'll start with 7A, an update on City of Brawley declaration of local emergency as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. Our overall outlook is once again presented by our fire chief, Mike York. I got the hang of it. Good evening again, Mayor Hamby and City Council members. Um, a brief update for this evening. Um, to use the word status quo, um, our numbers are looking the same. Uh, we have just uh, pretty pretty even increases across the board when it comes to tested personnel, negative personnel. Um, our numbers are are maintaining at levels they were. Um, we still do not have um, any change to local mandates. Um, there was a meeting. Uh, tonight, um, kind of exploratory meeting with the uh, Imperial County um, Board, and we'll, we're kind of waiting to see what the outcome is going to be um, in the following weeks. And it comes to, I think the only big news when we're talking about COVID currently is the variant data. Um, so Imperial County uh, Department of Public Health has updated their website to show uh, a little bit more information in regards to variant data. Um, so within the Imperial County, the most common variant lo recently is the Delta variant, which has gotten a lot of information in the news lately. Uh, we've had a total of 404 confirmed cases in Imperial County. The 18 to 49 age group is most affected. And um, <coughs> they've been looking at the vaccination status of personnel or persons that are uh, confirmed with the COVID variant. Um, not vaccinated are 57% of which 19% are less than 12 years old. So we're seeing the, the Delta variant affect school-aged children a little heavier. Uh, vaccinated personnel um, are 16%, and unknown is 27%. It's very important to note um, that of the 27% of the unknown vaccination status, 67% of those are two-thirds are asylum seekers. So we weren't able to track them or trace them. Um, other than that, we just continue working with our local state and federal partners, making sure we have PPE and equipment and we can continue to respond. If there are any questions, I will do my best. Yes, I have a question, Chief. Yes, sir. Um, on the, is there any talk on when they may do something with the masking? Because I noticed going to San Diego and I noticed going to Palm Desert. Um, it's pretty much, if you've been vaccinated, you don't need the mask indoors, you know, if you're in a shopping in a store or in a restaurant. If, if you have, haven't been vaccinated, they ask that you wear the mask. No one's really enforcing it. It's kind of like people are just kind of mm -hmm. doing what they want to do in San Diego and there. But here we have the mask mandate. So I'm wondering if there's been any talk as to when that might uh, be alleviated or when they might say it's up to the individual to decide what they want to do. That's the only question I have. Yes, sir. So that concept is called the self-attestation. So basically, if you're wearing a mask it's or you're not wearing a mask, you're self-attesting that you're vaccinated and you're following the rules of the, of the given locality. I am sure there's been quite a bit of discussion. There certainly has been in the circles that I'm purview in. Those aren't decision-making circles. Um, and I think that there's probably going to be a lot more information, and that is one of the major topics of the discussion going on in Pearl County this evening. Um, but we have no indication on a time. The uh, amended health order issued by Dr. Monday, our local health officer, um, had no end date. It was until such time as rescinded. So we okay. are all patiently waiting. Okay. Uh, Chief, uh, do you recall, I think the last time you gave us an update, I asked uh, if, if by chance you could give us an update, a number of how many uh, of those hospitalized have been uh, under the age of 18? Unfortunately, I can't. The, okay. the numbers aren't parsed out particularly like that. Um, uh, we're seeing what the individual's numbers have affected, but not hospitalized directly. 
Oh. And a lot of that has to do with um, HIPAA compliance. Uh, yeah. They can give yeah. vague details, but but they're refraining even from that. Got it. Thank you. Anyone else? No, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chief. Chief. <clears throat> Item seven B. Um, Tyler, I'll defer to you. Could you? Could you? Uh, yes. Uh, so the action before you, uh, Blackstone. You know you wanted to do that like an hour ago. Take care. I'll see you later. I can do it, Tyler. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. So um, the action before you is to discuss the potential action to adopt a resolution number 2021, uh, resolution of the City Council of City of Raleigh, California, authorizing the examination of sales, use, and transaction tax records, not a contract with HDL services. So as mentioned earlier, the HDL contract does exist and would continue to exist. Some of these changes and the reason that we need on a new resolution is more of an administrative type of function. Uh, the Board of Equalization no longer exists. It's been replaced with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, so that's one of the changes. The other is to add myself, the finance director slash city treasurer, as an authorized position and representative of the city along with the city manager uh, would retain uh, the ability, both of us, to see the sales tax record information, uh, which we currently already do, but we need to um, recognize that <laughs> in a formal document. And then the last thing is to formally add HDL, our current contract services, to be able to um, examine the sales tax records, do audits of those records, um, uh, file petitions or appeals on behalf of the city uh, for any um, reallocation or redistribution of sales taxes that were maybe paid improperly to other jurisdictions. Okay. Okay. The item has been presented. Is there a motion to approve? Yeah, I'll go ahead and make a motion, motion to uh, adopt the resolution as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Thank you, Carla. Thanks. Thank you. Item 7C is a discussion and potential action to approve the request submitted by Abir Shaba of Brawley Meat Market to authorize her business for off-sale of beer, wine, and liquor in accordance to a Type 21 ABC license. This will be presented by Chief of Police Jimmy Duran. Uh, Mr. Mayor, before that presentation, I am going to recuse myself. I own property that is uh, nearby that business, so I'm going to recuse myself from decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Backup is on pages 111 to 115. Chief. Good evening once again. Yeah, we received a application for a Type 21 ABC license. This is uh, what is called an off-sale general uh, license, which uh, seeks the approval of off-sale beer, wine, and liquor. Uh, so from the law enforcement perspective, we reviewed calls for service uh, uh, to this establishment and around the immediate <clears throat> area. We did not see uh, any issues or items of concern that would discourage us from supporting or, or indicating a reason uh, to dis disapprove this request. So it is our request that uh, this is approved at this point. And just to add to that, this was presented to you in the past that was voted and approved by council. Uh, at the time, the applicant had applied for the wrong ABC license, which is type 20, which does not allow for the sale of liquor, just beer and wine. Uh, so uh, she's amending the request for, to, a for a type 21. Okay. So if it looks familiar, that's why. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is there a motion to approve this item? Yeah, motion to approve item. I'll second it. Oh, just. Uh, got it. And, and with the second, I just I, I want to add a comment before you call for the vote. Just my my comment. I think it's important. Also, this is an established business that you know has has food. It is a market. Um, it, it, I, I I do think there it is one thing if it's a liquor only you know type establishment coming into a neighborhood. Um, there could be some social implications to that. But I think it's real important to point out this is an established. Um, really neighborhood market that does sell fresh meats, et cetera. So, um, you know, if this is something that continues to um, allow them to increase sales and whatnot, um, I, I, I think that, that could be a that's, a, that's one of the upsides I've considered. So I just want to make that comment before the I apologize, I didn't complete. I didn't complete what we said. We said the motion to approve item 7C. Okay. And I second. And I second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? I'll vote, vote nay. Passes. Three to one. 
Thank you. Don't knock the clock off. Yeah, don't <laughs> knock the clock off. He went to the word. <laughs> don't break the clock. You're ready. Is it? You're not? <laughs> I'm not. You need more water. I, I need well, more shut water. the door and we'll move on. You can do it. Give me a break. Like, that was too bad. <laughs> <laughs> shut the door and we'll move on. All right. Item 7D, discussion and potential action to approve memorandum of understanding or MOU between the Brawley Police Department and the Imperial County District Attorney's Office Victim Witness Assistance Program with the intent of setting a mutual goal of providing assistance in the event of a mass casualty or terrorist attack incident. This is presented by... Chief of Police, Jimmy Duran. Backup is on pages 116 to 120. Yes, good evening once again. Uh, we were approached by the Imperial County District Attorney's Office uh, witness, uh, Victim Witness Program, uh, and this was in reference to, to this MOU, which uh, they're suggesting be for two years. And really this addresses, in a, in a really simple way, if you have the opportunity to review the MOU, uh, I guess you, you can see that it's very simple. And it just uh, addresses uh, or outlines uh, response responsibilities and the type of assistance that can be made uh, to our citizens in the aftermath or during a, uh, an, a, an, an incident like the one described, which it could be a, uh, a, a potential crisis for our community. So uh, if you're not aware, Victim Witness is a participant of the Community Crisis Response Team. Uh, which in essence, uh, it just uh, collaborates with other organizations within Imperial County and really just creates a better response in the event of a crisis. And one of the biggest things that it can offer is uh, uh, a lot of assistance to the victims in the form of uh, informed crisis intervention, needs assessment, debriefing, uh, referral to local resources, emergency assistance, you know, property return and release, you know, things we don't think normally think about, but this, they're, they're set up to help out people with this. And of course, uh, assistance with vi victim compensation through uh, uh, the, the, the board there, you know, because there's some forms that got to be done in order for them to, to be able to do that, victims' rights, education, orientation on the overall criminal justice systems. Uh, so, so really, it just outlines uh, what they can do for our citizens in the event of a mass casualty or terrorist uh, attack, God forbid, that occurs, uh, but it really it just provides more resources. There's no cost uh, to participate or to, or to be in agreement with them. It just offers a little bit more assistance to, to our citizens. Okay. And you're okay with it? Yes, I am, sir. Okay. I'll make the motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between the Brawley Police Department and the Imperial County District Attorney's Office Victim Witness Assistant Program. Second the motion. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Thank Chief. You. Item 7E, discussion and potential action for deferral of impact fees for two projects submitted by Mark Gaddis, presented by City Manager Tyler Salcido. Backup is on pages 121 to 123. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before you today is the principal for G4 Construction, Mark Gaddis. Uh, he is requesting uh, consideration for a deferral of impact fees on two projects uh, until final inspection or COO. Uh, the first project is a single family residential home built under a USDA-RD 502 grant program. And the impact fees and capacity fees will be to the tune of about 18,344 uh, deferred again to uh, if approved by final inspection. Second project is an investment property. Uh, it's a triplex. The property needs to be upgraded to a one inch line uh, and meter f uh, from three quarters. Uh, currently, there is one unit on there, and it will add two additional units. And if I'm incorrect, please go ahead. You are correct. Um, uh, the credit was uh, staff was can give uh, G4 credit was given on the water and wastewater capacity fees since there's a line there already and providing service on a three quarter inch basis uh, line. Uh, so the uh, diff fees and the capacity fees for the, for that multi-unit property uh, would be 14,000 and change, 14,208 for deferral. And uh, Mr. Gaddis, please feel free to add. Good evening. So the city of Imperial implemented this uh, impact fee deferral program years ago to help jumpstart building in the city of Imperial just after the housing crash. And it really helped, it really helps small builders uh, get projects off the ground. As you just heard, for one home, the impact fee is $15,000. That's not the permit fee. We, we understand. Um, how much time would you need for construction? 
houses take about four months. The apartments probably take longer than that. Okay. Um, so it, it, it really helps small builders. Uh, we already rehashed six, eight months ago that Public Works implemented these drainage plans. They cost $6,000 for a, a housing lot. I just want to get lot. to the finish line here for you. Um, me? I just want to assist you in getting to the finish line. Um, yes. So six months would be sufficient time? Yes, it would. You, we would pay them upon final. Upon final or six months, whichever came first. Would that be sufficient time? Possibly. Okay, what would be sufficient time? I'm asking you. I haven't built a triplex in a really long time. I can't tell you how long it's going to take. Okay. Mm. A house, I can tell you. All right. A so, house is four months. Okay. So I'm trying to work with you here. What, what do you think you would need? If, if for example, because um, we're saying until the final inspection, but certainly if, if you held the project, then it was like three years later, we would obviously, you see what I'm saying? Is 12 months enough time? 12 months? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So could, could I make that motion? Uh, we would defer the impact fees for 12 months or the final inspection, whichever would come first. That would be a motion that I would make. Sure. That works for me. Is that is works for me? Okay. Okay. So second. That's my motion. That's a second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? I am curious. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mark. You got it. This maybe it's a discussion we need to have. I, I don't know how uh, how often it happens in a city of our size where, in general, um, impact fees are deferred until a certificate of occupancy is issued. Or until a final inspection. It's up to us. I've, I've proposed that a long time ago, and it's interesting because developers didn't want it. They were like, "It doesn't make any." Yeah, it does. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like I get these that requests like 10 years very ago. often, and it seems no, like no. But now you do. Yeah. You didn't 10 years ago. Yeah. I would I would always suggest it's like, why don't you do that? It's going to help. And it facilitates won't help. financing the project, yeah, right? Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. But you know, and I didn't necessarily want a lesson on what Imperial did and whatever. I mean, yeah. right. right. I'm the finish line. My only comment would be that, that I'm more in favor of the infill that he's yeah. trying to yeah. do no, here because I, I think it. that's important. They use and USDA financing here in Brawley because it's still and available and we're in talking, material as well. Yeah. We're talking about a limited number of, of, yeah. of, of, of homes or, 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 or buildings that he's going to make, whereas a big project, I, I worry a little bit more about the cash flow Understood. inflow in that situation. Yeah. So, I mean, I was in and favor this is of helping infill and This is cool. It, okay. Yeah, so, um, but it's if just I'm reading a, council. I'm coming here and rip on the right. city. Uh, if I'm reading uh, some of the comments correctly from council, uh, is there a desire uh, from council to direct staff to bring back maybe an ordinance uh, that addresses these, uh, uh, you know, deferral type things as a standard policy now uh, for infill, case, or, or you just want to continue the case by case? The case by case. Let's okay. Case by uh, just case. throwing it out there. We don't know what we're going to deal yeah. with. Okay. The only thing I would caution the, the city staff about is, and maybe it's not something that that's that's their thing to do, but don't allow them to occupy before we get the well, fees that's, because that's yep. the bigger issue, and we've had that happen. I think in the past a couple times, and so what I'd like to see is that we exercise a lot of caution on on not allow. Yeah, well, even with that, we sometimes they just occupy, and so I don't I don't think we should allow that. I mean, it, whatever we have to bring to bear. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. All right, item seven F discussion and potential action to adopt resolution number twenty twenty one dash delegating authority to the mayor to decide whether or not to issue letters of support requested by other agencies presented by. Taylor Salcido, back up is on pages 124 to 126. You as council, um, you're often called upon uh, to issue letters of support and or appreciation letters of individuals that have made you know, significant contributions to the community, et cetera. In many cases, the, the timing uh, of such requests are such that they don't come to us in time and are needed uh, prior to the uh, next council, regular council meeting is scheduled. Uh, what the resolution before you does is it authorizes the mayor to determine if this requested action is ceremor ceremonial in nature, easy for me to say, or is it in support of an action that would unquestionably have uh, support of the entire council, and then if that is the case, to direct the city manager to prepare the requested letter or resolution for the mayor's signature and issue the to the requesting agency. Uh, the letter or resolution would then be placed on the consent agenda 
uh, for the next uh, council's regular scheduled meeting. Um, Bill, uh, our city attorney here, drafted this resolution for your consideration that states what I just uh, commented on. I, I can tell you over the years in Calipatria, where I've been city attorney for more than 20 years, I get this question from the city manager three times a month. <laughs> And, do you and now every time or um, <laughs> uh, we, 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 what we do is we scratch our heads and think will would council be mad yeah. if we didn't issue it yeah. and and usually they would be yeah. I think if it's ceremonial it's ceremonial you know yes. but it is if it's something that obviously requires uh, discussion amongst the council I think that should yeah. remain that's the reason why we have a council mm -hmm. you know and so but ceremonial stuff I mean that can just go beyond the you know the mayor can just yeah. complete that especially if it's something that's obviously not controversial it's right. just you know like hey it's um this date of you know celebrated I, uh, every year yes. whatever, i don't know whatever i, I you know think what I mean? we did something for knights yeah. of columbus that was yeah like, the, like uh, uh, you know recognizing their hundred year yeah exactly year i thing. mean we don't need stuff. i think with that you kind know, of thing i'll give you i'll like, give you one that if came Sam up wants to dedicate like his entire I asked the mayor year you know to sam couch that one that came, that came up yesterday in calipatria i get the i get and i always get the text at 10 o'clock at night hey san diego state uh, applied for a grant and they want a letter of support yes well, who doesn't want San Diego State to get a grant? Right. right. Yes. So, um, but city manager can't, he, so, so Ron Medina and I up there for 20 years have been hoping the council doesn't get mad at us. So we thought it would be good to have a resolution down here. Okay. okay. So a motion to approve uh, item 7F. <laughs> But is that just for ceremonial items? Is that it, it? Also, state the resolution also states that if if uh, the mayor believes that it would be unanimous decision of a letter of support, for example, uh, that one bill you. So there are both in there, not just ceremonial. How does everybody feel about that? Yeah, I, I, I think the, there's a risk factor, right? So the risk is that, um, that a you know said mayor in the future okay right we're not picking right. on our mayor uh, but, you know <laughs> sends a letter that um is is not the unanimous belief of of the council then um you know obviously that that would be the risk so um but i i, I think a vast majority i think that can happen but um but, I, but I, th with this council yeah think about it maybe yeah. in the future it's like it, yeah. and it be that becomes precedent i yeah. mean that's where i think we'd really We've always brought things forth before council. That's the danger. And like our intentions and working with each of you, I'm cool. Mm -hmm. But if it's somebody in the future and they take that liberty, yeah. that's a different story. You maybe, know, so maybe we like, start with yeah. ceremonial I would and, say and ceremonial. be a little cautious yeah, with, um, um, with letters else. of support yeah. because okay. you may not want to support yeah. a project because it indirectly has maybe a tax. Right. Or maybe it has an impact. Involved. Like, yeah. or, or, or maybe there's. Um, Quite honestly, maybe there's a conflict. Yeah, it, professional conflict or something else. You know. So. Okay, so I, I actually would draw that motion, right, and reward it. Correct. Right. Uh, how do we do it? For you ceremonial. Is yeah, that just thinking? for ceremonial purposes. Did you make a motion uh, to approve the item uh, to include only ceremonial letters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, motion to approve item seven F to include only ceremonial letters. Okay. I'll second that motion. Uh, okay. okay. Moved and seconded. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? That'll, that'll cover about 80% of it. Right, yeah. right. Perfect. Okay. So that, that's a big help. It's a like, big help. But I, I get what you're saying, though. I get yeah, it. Because the future. Things got to happen. You guys have been here for a long time, so you yeah. totally understand yeah. that. Again. For someone else, like, next year, <laughs> uh, next year um, it will be Mayor Couchman, <laughs> and then <laughs> it'll be like ceremonial letters, back, like right? making um, <laughs> February 1st through, you know, the, the, the 20 uh, whatever it is. Uh, Sam Couchman month, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> well, you're gonna get that yeah. one anyway. Right, you're gonna get that I mean, 68 years. I'm gonna go ahead and sign that one. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go ahead and sign that one. Well, yeah. they, you know, <laughs> there is a holiday. <laughs> there is a holiday. <laughs> okay, all right. He will be there. He's gonna yeah, make his own holiday. I'm gonna have to use this gavel in a second. Yeah, right. Hit him with it. Item 8, informational report. Item 8A is a record of building permits for September 2021 in the city of Brawley prepared by Oscar Escalante, our interim building official. Backup is on pages 127 and 128. Anytime we get two pages it's always good. It's of building good. permits, it's nice. Yes, it's always good. Um, 8B is 2021 cattle call parade chair protocol, pages 129 to 130. And this is the most important thing on yes, the agenda. Yes, definitely. 
when you can put your chairs out for the parade and where you that, can put that them is out. what we will it's name the, one we get the, the sam most, protocol it's the one we get the sam most feedback Couchman, on i guarantee chair you. Protocol. the couchman the chair, protocol. Right? yeah and george drives around and if there's a really nice you know folding camping chair he'll probably i'll take it, it so i'll take careful. it be like this isn't part of the chair protocol yeah you can collect it after. It's the same <laughs> protocol it's always been. So. Item 9, City Council Member Reports. Please keep these brief tonight. We'll start with uh, Councilman Wharton. Absolutely. Um, well, just fresh, it was already mentioned, but it was a, a true pleasure to be part of the um, um, fairly unusual swear-in ceremony at the Stockman's Club this morning because of the number of... Uh, of uh, um, personnel and staff from within as well as from outside of the agency that were able to gather together with members of the community. So I want to thank the chief for um, helping to, I'm sure, mastermind that um, whole ceremony. But I thought it was a great um, testimony of all the things that we have been talking about as council uh, um, about the new direction and, and um, really even the um, very uh, deliberate approach that we have to um, um, setting kind of the new course and the vision for the city. So I thought all that was accomplished and huge congratulations obviously to all the personnel involved, um, our, our commanders, our sergeant, our new officer, their families, and um, it was just, a, again, a pleasure to be there. Um, outside of that, um, I will um, be pretty busy, I think, uh, the, the rest of this week as well as next uh, with uh, many things happening on the calendar. So, Mr. Mayor, that will be my comment. Thank you, Donnie. Councilman Castro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, just real quick, I, I had the opportunity to go speak at Desert Valley High School this past Friday. I was very excited to actually go back because I was a student there for two two terms, two different terms during high school. Um, what, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> you can only go once. Yeah, yeah, you, can, you can. <laughs> Either way, uh, um, you know, they helped me through some difficult times and helped me graduate, you know, on time and then run off to the Marine Corps. And, um, and but when I told that, I told the students that I was recruited there, uh, one, it made them wonder, like, really how old I am. And I felt old for the first time in my life. I was recruited there in December of 1995. Um, and the kids were really excited. Um, so I just want to thank Mr. Mungia, uh, the principal there, and Mr. Mendes, for allowing me to um just to go there and distinguished alumni there yeah <laughs> i am i am i mean i graduated from buhs but still it it, it it was it was it's always important to go back and talk to those kids because it inspires them it just shows them that you don't have to go where people are telling you, you got it you're gonna go um you know unless it's a positive direction and for many of those kids they're not told that they're told uh, that they're going the wrong way and they're basically um you know uh, discarded already at that at such a young age and I think they're all talented they're all valuable and they have a lot to offer this community so I told them that and uh, anyways they were very happy and then they were they were stoked that you know that one of their council members actually uh, went to the school twice <laughs> so um uh, and I hope uh, Mr. Mr. Smirton that I, I wasn't out of line or I offer them and perhaps Mr. Mayor that um, we could we could partner with our high school and our uh, Desert Valley and BUHS to allow some of those students to come here and be part of the proceedings here. And I want them to know how government works and come here. And I'm sure you guys have done this in the past, um, but you know I did extend that out to them. Uh, maybe I wasn't a little out of line, but it'd be neat, and I think they they would appreciate it. Uh, and then the second thing is that we're planning uh, Walk the Line 2022, which will come through the city of Brawley. Uh, and it would just be the whole length of the U uh, the California um, U.S. Mexico border, the length of the California, uh, basically the California border. But it will dip, uh, it'll come dip north and then back again to. But it will come through Brawley, and we're hoping we can accomplish that in April, so that it's not too hot. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, Councilman Nava. Uh, very briefly, just want to thank staff, everybody. I was able to also attend the ceremony this morning. That was very nice. And uh, it's great to see that uh, people are, you know, being brought on to our organization and pro promoted from within. So very good to see. It's also uh, improving the police department. So uh, congratulations to that department. Um, also was able just briefly to meet with the, the mayor and uh, uh, a gentleman who's representing a developer and uh, working on the potential for a public-private partnership, and we'll see how that develops. 
a lot of other things to report, but I'll pass at the moment. I know it's been a long night for everybody and probably everybody listening. So thank you all very much for paying attention and for engaging yourself in your community. Thank you all. Thank you, George. Mayor Pro Tem Kachman. I guess I won't pass. Um, I had the privilege of attending my 50-year class reunion, Brawley Junior High School, class of 71. Uh, since our last meeting, uh, we had about 109 people attend. Uh, Forty, some of our classmates have passed on. Um, and so it was, it was a pretty exciting evening. I've got to see somebody I hadn't seen in 49 years, and I thought that was really kind of neat. So, and we had that at the Stockman's Club. Uh, I had also attended the Boys and Girls Club combo auction at the Stockman's Club along with the mayor. Uh, and that was a great event and it was well attended, I thought, due to, you know, some, some, some issues, you know, I think with attendance now because of the COVID and things of that nature, but, but very well attended and I thought a very representative group and uh, I think they raised quite a bit of money for the Boys and Girls Club locally as they always do. And that's due to the generosity of the people of Brawley and other communities here in the Valley. And I think that that's an important part of, of doing business and helping the children. Um, IVRO, I did attend this morning the IVROPCF uh, board meeting, the community foundation. We're talking about the Dancing with the Stars right now, and that may that may be happening this year, and we're working on it as, as we speak. Okay, and also the swearing in of, um, of our police members, uh, especially Jonathan Blackstone and uh, the, the Sergeant uh, Gutierrez, and I think one of the officers, and I can't remember his name. But we did attend that. It was well attended, and uh, a shout out, I think, it's to, the, to the police chief for that ceremony and also to the Stockman's Club for hosting that. And I thought it was a great venue for that and it afforded the families an opportunity to be there you know, during these times when we have to be a little more careful about what we do. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good venue and it, it worked out really well. And so a shout out for that and congratulations to those individuals. And with that, that's my report. Thank that was you. two shout outs, Thank bro. You, what's up? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was shouting out tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be out. on Dancing with the Stars? Uh, no, no, but you are, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I can't raise that kind of money. He's on the yeah. <laughs> committee. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you can. I would pay to watch you dance. <laughs> I'm pretty good, actually. I think. Wow. He got you in the Desert Valley twice, bro. <laughs> pretty good. Second page. Yeah. <laughs> As Ramon was talking about Desert Valley, I, I thought of a quote that I heard, you know, through mentoring, fostering, whatever, that um, for a lot of these kids from, you know, hard places, difficult backgrounds, that it just takes one positive adult uh, influence in their life to change the course of their life. So thank you for doing that because as you experienced, you know, in, in your youth that sometimes it takes the right kind of guidance to put you on the right path to become productive absolutely, instead absolutely of true. instead of some of the people that we see that detract from yep. from our society here yeah, so thank it's you absolutely for that. true i would say it's actually way easier to succeed than it is to fail you know it's like you almost have to want to get off track in order to fail yeah and so yeah i appreciate that that you're doing that as well i, I like talking to kids i mean they they do listen so oh you know? yeah they absolutely do yeah i as Sam mentioned, we, we attended several different events around the city as, as COVID kind of lets up or as our, our restrictions let up, we are required to go to more and more of these events like we used to. So yeah. uh, on the one hand, it's, it's uh, an extra responsibility, but on the other hand, it is nice to get out and see community members again that we've, we haven't been able to see them face to face in quite some time. Um, I, as George mentioned, we've, we've met with different, uh, with a developer here and there. Um, we got a pretty good presentation tonight of some hopeful uh, upcoming developments. Met with uh, San Diego State University uh, staff to um, discuss an expansion project, a hopeful expansion project um, here at our uh, Brawley branch. Letter of support? No? Yeah, letter of support, probably, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I had the opportunity to uh, perform a song, a Johnny Cash song, at uh, the Master Chorale concert, a cowboy concert at the Pioneer Museum uh, last week. Master's so, call. Can you give us a little bit of the... Sure. I've yeah, heard you. You're pretty good. <laughs> just a little bit. Come on. You just check it out on YouTube. Sing it, right. <laughs> sing it, sing it together. <laughs> sing it on the Next time I'll bring my guitar. There it's, you go. Hey. It helps if I have, a, if I have a little bit of a cold, <laughs> okay. then I really do sound... You know, All right. I get the Johnny sing Cash. You can hear them. 
Um, I've, I've fielded some calls about the utility user tax. Different people have called to find out some of the details. And of those people, they sound like they're in support of that. Um, and we're hopeful that even with a, with a mail-in ballot where people can either choose to just see that it's a tax and check no and send it in or just throw it in the trash altogether, that hopefully people, more people will uh, vote yes than no. Um, and with that, I'll end my report. Mr. Mayor, I, I forgot one item. There was uh, the Pioneers Memorial Hospital open house. Uh, we also attended that, uh, the mayor and I. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a nice event. And they, they had an open house, and Dr. Karaitis, Dr. Fareed, and, and some of the other doctors that are out there. It was a good event. I'd forgotten to mention that. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to Dr. Karaitis is kind of a comedian. It's, like, it's almost like <laughs> a couple of our council members. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, item 10, city attorney report. That's the report. Okay. Item 11, city clerk report. Nothing to report. Wow. Okay. And with that, we'll move to item 12, closed session. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.